Hi, welcome and thank you for joining us today for day two of Stanford High's fall conference. We're discussing a set of radical policy proposals for addressing the societal challenges and opportunities created by AI. I'm Eric Brynjolfsson and hosting with me is Dan Ho. We're both professors at Stanford and part of the Institute for Human-Centered AI, which we call HI. Yesterday, we heard two proposals, one about the value and feasibility of universal basic income and, the potential, and one about the potential of middleware to protect people against online misinformation. Today, we'll have two more proposals, one on data protection and one for AI accountability. Thanks, Eric. Yesterday, you started us off with a call for human agency, agency in the sense that the future is ours to choose, or as you put it, the key is not what technology will do to us, but what we will do with technology. And let me begin today's session just with a few uh, opening kind of framing remarks. Um, first, as these proposals illustrate, technology poses some basic challenges to our existing institutions and laws. On the public sector side, I think that panels yesterday highlighted that really nicely. The middleware uh, panel illustrated the challenges for antitrust in the First Amendment to grapple with the rise of uh, platforms. The, on the UBI panel, as Mark Duggan put it, the public sector to date remains ill-equipped to deal with advances in AI to improve benefits programs. And uh, as the keynote yesterday highlighted, um, one of the basic questions is, how to wrestle with the widespread documentation for potential bias in AI systems and how anti-discrimination law, which was written with intentional human discrimination in mind, uh, can be updated to provide uh, for accountability. On the, similarly, on the private sector side, there are questions about capacity. As the middleware panel noted, companies may not always have the capacity to decide what types of information should be amplified or suppressed. Or as Dr. Rahman Chowdhury will talk about, how can the private sector itself develop the kinds of internal compliance structures to turn abstract ethical principles into concrete practice? Second, uh, every panel is exploring key policy levers from tax to antitrust to information disclosure to product standards to shape the role of technology. And uh, as you kind of nicely noted, Eric, uh, what unifies them is a kind of concern for human agency and autonomy. UBI is attempting to reduce the impact of automation on individuals. Middleware is attempting to reduce the power of platforms uh, to improve democratic uh, discourse or autonomy uh, in that discourse. Data cooperatives, uh, which we'll talk about today, are an attempt really to augment the power of individuals to bargain collectively for their data rights. And audits are meant uh, really uh, to hold developers accountable for the costs, for instance, that may be imposed on vulnerable communities and for such communities to challenge forms of deployment. And third, another uh, theme running throughout these proposals is the realignment of the public and the private. Each of the proposals involves, in a sense, a kind of reconceptualization of governmental authority. Uh, an AI Bill of Rights would make enforceable uh, rights to privacy, fairness, transparency, and explainability that we haven't seen yet for AI systems. UBI would require a potentially a tax on the tech sector to fund and distribute something like the Freedom Dividend. And middleware uh, may call for a government agency to foster a kind of middleware market. And today's proposal similarly uh, will uh, borrow from these kinds of uh, models. Data coalitions uh, call for a data relations board modeled after the National Labor Relations Board to set rules and adjudicate data disputes. Audit systems uh, may require an audit oversight board modeled after something like the public company accounting oversight board that regulates financial, the financial accounting industry. So we hope that these panels will illustrate how exchange across stakeholders, disciplines, and fields, which we very much prize here at Stanford High, can help to inform these policy ideas. You're muted, Eric. Thank you, Dan, for learning about this technology. Uh, when we think about uh, America's leading universities, like say Stanford University, I suspect that most people think about the research that we do and, and hopefully the teaching that we do. But I've learned that another important way we can contribute to society is by convening a meeting of the minds around important topics of the day. 
with this conference and at High generally, we're hoping to foster the kind of conversation that, that you just described, Dan. Uh, we want to convene a range of stakeholders around the future of governing AI. And we've intentionally brought together individuals representing both the pi private sector and the public sector. People like yesterday's keynote speaker, Eric Lander, who's in the cabinet of the US government. And today, as, as you heard, we're gonna sh shortly hear from Raman Chowdhury of Twitter, who we will uh, hear about from an industry perspective. We also have a range of experts from disciplines from engineering and the social sciences, as well as humanities and other areas. Um, and we also have proponents as well as skeptics alike to engage in this reflection. We believe the proposals only get stronger when they face constructive criticism as well as helpful support. And that includes not only from the other panelists that we'll hear from, but also from all of you who are participating in this conference online around the world. Today's format is going to be the same as yesterday's. Each proposer is going to share her ideas followed by a panel discussion, and then we'll take questions from all of you. So please be sure to use the Slido question feature on the website and ask questions by Twitter. You can tag our handle at Stanford High, as well as the hashtag, which I think is just below me here, uh, hashtag radical policies for AI. We wanna hear from you, and that's why we put together this conference. We'll do our best to ask your questions during the conference and put them to the panelists and the proposers. But you should also know that we keep all the questions and, and make sure that the proposers and panelists hear them after the conference as well. So looking forward to hearing from you all. Great, thanks, Eric. Uh, so uh, that takes us to our second keynote address by Dr. Rahman uh, Chowdhury. So let me introduce her here. Uh, Rahman is the director mm -hmm. of Meta at Twitter. Uh, which stands for Machine Learning, Ethics, Transparency, and Accountability, and predates the other meta that you've been hearing so much about uh, these days. She's a general partner and co-founder of the Parity Responsible Innovation VC Fund. She's a leader in the field of applied algorithmic ethics and has worked to develop solutions for ethical, explainable, and transparent AI. At Twitter, she leads a team of applied researchers and engineers to identify and mitigate algorithmic harms on the platform, which we're very much hoping to hear more about. Um, and previously, uh, uh, Rahman was the CEO and founder of Parity AI, which provides algorithmic auditing tools to companies, connecting really nicely with our uh, second panel of the day. Um, prior to that, she was the global lead for responsible AI at Accenture, where she led the design of the Fairness Tool, a uh, first in industry algorithmic tool to identify and mitigate bias in AI systems. She's also deeply engaged in AI global policy. She's a board member of the UK Center for Data Ethics and Innovation and serves on the UNESCO Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development. Uh, she has also been an advisor to the UK House of Lords Parliamentary Group on AI. Uh, Roman, welcome. And uh, please feel free to share your screen when you're ready. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate your time here. Um, so let me figure out how to share my screen and that would be helpful. Um, bear with me one minute. You got it. Awesome, thank you. Let me just go into present mode. Beautiful, great. Well, thank you all for having me here and thank you for the warm welcome and introduction. Um, as mentioned, my name is Dr. Ramon Chowdhury. I'm the director of a team known as Meta, ML Ethics, Transparency and Accountability at Twitter, I'm also founder and GP of the Parity Responsible Innovation Fund. Um, so in my experience, um, both as a political scientist, which I am by training, as well as a data scientist, which I am in practice, would like to talk a little bit today about reimagining re AI systems governance. So in, in the theme of uh, radical shifts in policy and how can we think more radically uh, and differently about how things are done today and how to reimagine the world. Um, so just as a bit of a, a background for folks in the audience who may be a little less familiar, so the current state of algorithmic ethics and regulation, the, the research in the field dates back much further, but the field of applied algorithmic ethics is only a few years old. And contrary to popular discourse, regulation isn't behind. It's actually moving rather quickly. Uh, and there's this phenomenon known as the Colling Ridge Dilemma, or also the there's an aspect of it called the pacing problem um, that regulation needs to avoid. And, and essentially it boils down to this statement. When change is easy, the need for it cannot be foreseen. When the need for change is apparent, change has become expensive, difficult, and time consuming. In other words, when the area to make policy and regulation was very simple and easy because nobody was interested in it, it was very hard to figure out 
four years ago, whether we should be regulating about the future of work or whether we should be talking uh, about self-driving cars or whether we should worry about children's minds uh, in schools uh, being warped by algorithms, we have no idea. Today, we have a clear definition, I, I understanding of the harms that can be introduced by the system. But of course, that means that these systems are significantly more entrenched and much more difficult and time consuming to do anything about. So the Colling Ridge dilemma basically states that technology changes exponentially, but social, economic, and legal systems change incrementally. So the graph here pretty much illustrates Moore's law and political change and social change moves much slower. I will say there is a reason for that. It should be that way. A society in which political, social, and economic structures are constantly shifting is a very insecure and unstable society. Um, we want democratic systems that are incremental, that are you know, actually taking in a wide range of thoughts and opinions and leading to change that is not so drastic and dramatic that you know, any negative externalities cannot be dealt with and that any, change, any other change is unforeseen. So that would actually be a worse world than one in which our regulatory systems, our economic systems, and our social systems were moving at the, at the rate of Moore's law. That would be a very, very frightening and uh, disorienting world to live in. But that being said, there is a growing AI governance imperative. So this KPMG study uh, points out that 94% of IT decision makers said that they feel firms need to focus more on corporate responsibility and ethics. I'm going to pause on that term, ask you to remember this term, corporate responsibility and ethics. But you know, we are actually seeing movement from top down and bottom up. We're seeing regulatory movement by the EU. Um, we're also seeing strong indicators in the US from the FTC, and we have a plethora of standards bodies, including the standard standards bodies, NIST, ISO, et cetera, as well as entire new groups and organizations that are spinning up just to talk about algorithmic ethics. We do have a crystal ball. You know, it, a lot of us in tech, including those of us who work in responsible AI, sometimes have a bit of hubris about our field, and we think we're the first people to have ever encountered a certain problem. That is untrue. We have a crystal ball here of GDPR. We know how regulation may go. Um, so there is one world in which we have GDPR-like regulation. I will tell you, having been on you know, the industry side after GDPR was implemented, this is what we saw. Companies will be slow to adopt. There is a massive gap between regulation and implementation. There is a huge ability and skills gap between what the law called for and what companies were actually capable of doing, not because of malicious actors or you know, people actively you know, not wanting to comply, but quite literally, it's easy to say the right to not be found. And it's easy to say um, you know, the right to access your data. Implementing those two mandates is incredibly difficult. Um, how can you ensure that every piece of information about an individual will not make it into uh, you know, any aspect of your systems if they have elected into the right to not be found, even information that you are maybe collecting secondhand or thirdhand? This is not to say that companies should not com comply. It's to say that regulation needs to be written in a way that is sensible, not just for people, but from an implementation perspective. And also I will add, law does not ensure compliance. I think sometimes we do live in an idealistic world in the field of responsible AI. We think that if a law is passed, that means it is all done. It is not done. There is a compliance part um, and it can very well, like welcome to the field of risk management. It can very well happen that a company can decide, I will you know, take the hit and will not comply because it's more worth it for me to make this revenue. Um, and again, this is not to pass judgment on any group or groups, it's to say this is the state of the world, this is what happens. One issue with existing laws today when talking about algorithmic ethics, and I'm very happy to see Dev Raji presenting here today, is that ex existing laws lack a clear definition of the term audit while attempting to mandate them. So back to this gap between regulation and implementation, uh, it's even worse than something that would be onerous for companies. What happens when, if a law is passed that mandates an audit without a clear definition of what an audit is, that is ripe for regulatory capture. It is ripe for inducing monopolies. How? Well, now we have a vacuum of information and the individuals who will come and fill this vacuum of information will obviously be policy motivated actors who will want to make this law done in the way that would benefit them the most. Uh, and in doing so, create a world in which company, their, them and the companies like them would be the most successful. So it'd be monopoly inducing. So there is a fear of, you know, going back to this Colling Ridge dilemma of being too premature in passing laws before understanding what the downstream impl implications of these laws are, not just on people, but actually quite literally structurally 
uh, and how we are setting the stage for the ability to have further policy and even the ability to have good market competitiveness. So I asked you earlier to remember this term corporate responsibility and ethics. Um, flaws in status quo, framing ML ethics as this concept of corporate social responsibility, corporate responsibility is a failure state. Uh, first, because ML ethics will then always be viewed as what you would call in the consulting industry or in many other industries, a loss leader. In other words, nobody ever expects to do responsible AI and ML and have a better product or have an improved outcome. They do it because they have to, they do it because it looks good and the benefit of it is not actually part of their core business metrics or their revenue. It's sort of you know nice to have and we need to do it so that regulatory stay off our backs. It is not, not how I wanna build my team. It's not where I think this field should be. It results in an uphill battle where practitioners are viewed as the enemies of real engineers. Well, that is not the case. We're actually here to help build better products, just like everybody else in the room is. So why do we care and why do these flaws matter? Why am I pointing them out? Well, number one is, you know, in order to actually enact real change, whether in companies or with regulation, we need broader sweeping cultural change driven from the bottom up. Um, second is we, then we need regulation to help set guidelines for this cultural shift. In other words, we have to all want to comply and then we, we will look to regulators to say, well, tell me what compliant is and that's a good place to be in. And importantly, we're seeing the start of this today. By and large, practitioners are looking for implementable practices, not principles or codes of conduct or anything like that. What people want to know is in my day to day, in my job, what do I do to ensure algorithmic ethics and responsible AI. So here's my presentation of an alternate future reality or better future reality or the one that I would like to realize. Um, so I'm not here just to point out problems, but to help try to make a roadmap. So first principle is ML and AI are not inherently bad things. There's nothing inherently bad about them. Some people actually disagree. Some people think that they are inherently bad things um, structurally because of what they are and what they represent and what they may you know, sort of by design entail. If one thinks that, then this is not, you do not want a responsible AI team, you want an AI abolition team. If you do want a responsible AI team, the first principle is that this is not a bad thing. We are not here to fight product teams. We are actually here to improve the quality of products that are built. And this is how to meaningfully engage a team like mine. First is being engaged in go no go decisions, being the individual in the party that represents the conscience, um, you know, the ethical use and being the people who are the most skilled in the room at understanding what the ethical implications can be and having that viewpoint respected. Second is what we need are community-driven standards to bridge reality and aspiration. And again, back to the danger of having regulation that does not adequately understand or define what a company would need to do to be compliant may lead to a worse outcome than not having done anything. So, so we need community-driven standards development to build reality and aspiration. Uh, I think this is you know, key within what Divya is going to be talking about. Third is addressing the socio part of the socio-technical system. So what does this mean in terms of the context of deployment? When this model goes out into the world, what is the impact it has on individuals? We're talking jobs, income, livelihood, et cetera. This is why intrigued by uh, Andrew's UBI, um, what does it mean to actually supplement individuals so that they are not so worried about this apocalyptic algorithmic future taking away their jobs, which some people very much are. Next is ensuring meaningful ownership of data and interaction with product post-launch. Again, back to Tibia's presentation. Uh, ensuring proactive harms identification to limit reactive harms mitigation. So back to what Deb's talking about, algorithmic auditing. Um, so how can we uh, make sure that we're not just ambulance chasers? We're not just trying to find the fire and then putting it out, but we're stopping fires from happening. Um, very interested in Francis's presentation on middleware, because a lot of this can rely on third party uh, groups and entities that are better equipped and engaged to answer this than companies can. Um, and finally, developing the right standards and regulations that speak to how practitioners do their work. How can we create sensible regulation? So how do we get there? Education, democratization, empowering specialists, and meaningful regulation. So the first is education, which I think has been a topic of conversation that many, many people have. Uh, I won't spend too long on it, but I will add something very specific is there's a difference between education and training. And I will credit uh, my team's PM, Yuta Williams, for teaching me the difference between education and training. Um, education is what most groups provide, which is a high level 30,000 foot view of why should you worry about algorithmic ethics? 
Fortunately, with many folks, we are past that stage and now we need training. And what we need is very clearly context specific in your job and what you do in the day to day. What do you need to do to play your part in algorithmic ethics? And this is very, very important because one phenomenon I increasingly see is this concept of moral outsourcing. Uh, you know, paradoxically, when a team like mine exists, um, when an ML ethics team exists at a company uh, and, you know, policy folks will agree with this, legal folks will agree with this, and security folks will agree with this, and, and privacy. Um, the average engineer may think they don't have to worry about this anymore because that's what we are here for. That is untrue. We are not here to handle end-to-end -end every aspect of potential uh, ethical missteps. Everybody plays a role in this. So training helps educate people on their role to play. It is a company-wide uh, endeavor. Everybody has a role to play. Training provides people an understanding of what they need to do. Second is democratization. Um, so I'm going to specifically talk about tooling, um, but we can also talk about whether access to data or, you know, understanding what models are being used and being able to interact with them and, you know, opt in and opt out. Um, but I will say for the average data scientist, there is you know, a significant amount of open source tooling. Is it fully encompassing every single thing we should be addressing? No, it is not. But is it a good place to start? Absolutely. And we are seeing the most common cloud-based ML platforms implementing um, some of these technical uh, interventions. So aside from the qualitative interventions, the product and design interventions, we do have actionable things that an average data scientist can do. Um, and at a larger scale, companies and organizations, as they move into this you know, ML ops and standardizing their productionization of data science models, they can think about the idea of responsible ML ops. So what does it mean to, to standardize at every stage of the productionizing process? What are the checks that need to be done and what sort of things should be monitored and tracked? Next is empowering specialists. So as I mentioned, for engineers, we have open source tooling, et cetera. But then there's the, the uh, aspect of responsible AI that is about the socio part, the context, the, the humanity. And this is where uh, critical voices and non-engineering functions need to be elevated and hired. Uh, we need folks that do deep user research and they need to be working side by side with product, not just to share product improvements, but actually to talk about you know, meaningfully what it is people want and how best to implement it. Um, and finally, reevaluating team placement in the org and in incentive motivators. So a big topic of discussion is how do we get everybody on board with this? We have already seen in other industries the best place um, to motivate change is to do it in ways in which people are incentivized in their day-to-day -day jobs, right? I think in Silicon Valley, we love to think that our, our jobs are our identities, but you know, for many people, it's a job and they show up and there's no problem with this. They show up and they do what they're supposed to do and they go home at the end of the day. Well, that's fine, but then we need to think about where you know, ML ethics teams are situated. For example, my team sits in an engineering function. And in doing so, my counterparts are people who are building products and tools and building the ML infrastructure for the company. It was the same at Accenture. It puts you in a very different place than if you sit in a completely different part of the company removed from product. And second, incentive motivators. We saw in DEI, the best way to move the needle was to tie compensation and promotion to the diversity of a team. Well, how do we, how do we ensure that avoiding ethical missteps or identifying and mitigating ethical harms is an incentive motivator and it's something that is tracked and rewarded when people are able to take these actions. And finally, the concept of meaningful regulation. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about some work we did at Twitter this year. Um, you know, we've been doing a lot of, a lot of work on uh, identifying and mitigating bias, but important, and obviously a lot of companies do this work. What we are trying to do is figure out how to be transparent um, and share in the open and talk about the challenges we face in doing this work. It is uh, my concern if we end up in an all or nothing world where we have to provide a perfect outcome, otherwise everything is tanked and that is not how anything uh, works and that's not how change happens. Um, so, you know, our biggest example of this is our algorithmic bias bounty. So earlier this year at DEF CON, uh, which is a big hacker conference, um, we introduced a bias bounty challenge that was inspired by security bug bounties. Um, my first time at DEF CON was three years ago, and I was so surprised to see um, industry, you know, big companies opening up to anybody who wants to, you know, opening up their and their tools to anybody who'd want to hack at them. And if they found a problem, these individuals find a problem, they get rewarded. And this did not, this practice does not exist in responsible AI. In responsible AI, what we find is people do the work. There are graduate students, 
there are lay people who are interested who do the work of identifying harms in models, um, and they're not rewarded for the work they do. And even though they are net making these products better, they are making everyone's experience better, uh, and they are inspirational for a lot of folks who work in industry. Well, we instituted the first bias bounty challenge. Um, we took our image cropping algorithm, we created a rubric uh, to, that we would grade it by. We even opened the rubric to the public for critique. Um, and we held a competition and we were amazed at the outcome. And I'll tell you a few reasons why this starts talking to community-driven knowledge and community-driven regulation, as well as you know, uh, efficiently and rapidly incorporating a diversity of opinion. So we had um, 30 plus submissions. So it was a one week challenge. We had, a we had 30 plus submissions from over 10 countries, uh, which was not something we could have replicated on our teams, right? So our teams in Silicon Valley do not have the diversity, global diversity, income diversity, educational diversity, racial diversity, religious diversity, you name it, that we would want to have if we are to say we are making a fully inclusive uh, algorithm. Um, but in opening up to the public and giving everybody the ability to poke at what we are doing uh, and giving them a structured way to provide feedback, we got thoughts and opinions from folks ranging from graduate students to startup founders um, to my, one of my favorite, which was, you know, a, I call it a citizen data scientist. In other words, not somebody who didn't know how to program or code. And what they did was they padded a few images on a pixel and they demonstrated how they could uh, change where the, where the model was choosing to crop the picture by, by uh, selectively placing pixels, something one can do in Microsoft Paint or Adobe uh, Photoshop. So you know that was an example of our first place winner who created a uh, custom made style GAN algorithm essentially to hack our model to our you know, most generalizable winner who was a citizen data scientist who used no coding and programming. So we got a diversity of opinions. We were faced with uh, questions and challenges that were above and beyond anything our team could have produced, which is wonderful in such a short period of time. But importantly, and maybe most importantly, uh, one of the most interesting things that came out of it was we have a community tested rubric. We put this measurement tool out there and we asked people use this to identify issues in our model. Because as we within industry proceed to do this work, it is hard for us to understand how to create the best measurement tools and assessment tools to identify biases and harms. Um, and that is only half of the step. The other uh, you know, a paper that we have released in the last few weeks identifies that there is algorithmic amplification of the political right on Twitter. I choose those words very carefully. Algorithmic amplification does not mean algorithmic bias. What we see is that a certain group of people are, um, you know, their content is shown more often than another group of people. Why that is happening is very complex and very interesting uh, and not something we know the answer to yet. Um, and it's something we are embarking on over the next year is a significant area of inquiry to understand where it is coming from. Why, why am I, you know, kind of raising this point and talking, talking about it quite a bit is again, back to this idea of a socio-technical system. If this is a function of user behavior and people's contributions um, and what people are talking about, that is very different from saying algorithmic bias, which is baked into the DNA of how this, this model is built. Um, so we need more diverse discussion that comes from the bottom up and that helps drive meaningful regulation. That helps drive a world in which we are actually listening to the needs that you know, people are surfacing companies are involved and they're able to actually switch and pivot their products to be more effective. And regulators are in a world in which they're not chasing down violators and they're actually working with companies uh, and individuals to provide meaningful and helpful regulation and especially regulation that will withstand the test of time. Back to this idea of, you know, we need regulation that reinforces stability um, and resilience it's incredibly important that we think about how our regulation is constructed, how it's done meaningfully. So in conclusion, I'm extremely excited about today's talk. So I alluded a bit to how they relate to the topics that we're raising today. Um, and overall, I was thinking through thematically, um, you know, what, uh, what are some common themes that I see in all of these presentations, all of these radical policy ideas? And there are three, and they're actually, uh, interestingly, um, three attributes of healthy complex systems, and they are resilience, 
uh, self-organization and hierarchy. Resilience is incredibly important. How does this complex system um, you know, react to stress? How quickly is it able to rebound and heal itself? That's step one. Two is self-organization. The most efficient way to organize and create a durable solution is actually to enable self-organization of the atomized entities. So as we think about individuals or third-party groups being engaged in auditing models or determining for themselves how they want their data to be used, we are enabling and allowing self-organization. And finally, hierarchy, which one may think is at odds with this idea of self-organization, but it's actually a natural byproduct. So, you know, in creating a data collective, one can have a data advocate, which is an individual that is a trusted individual who represents your needs. And what you will notice is good hierarchy and resilient hierarchy moves from the bottom up. And that's really critical to see. So I'm extremely excited for today's talks and also let's uh, open for a couple of questions. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thanks so much uh, for uh, that uh, uh, keynote address, uh, Roman. Um, we do have a fair number of questions. Um, so let me go ahead and start uh, with the first one. Um, and I'll combine two of them. Uh, the first one is by Irina Asmundson, who asks, how do we have community driven change when end user license agreements can limit the exploration of how algorithms work to internal or limited external auditors, which connects really nicely, I think, to the um, proposal by Deb for algorithmic auditing. Um, and uh, I think, let me combine that with kind of a, a second question, which is, you know, uh, you had mentioned this really interesting work on the amplification of political content. And as I understand it, uh, Twitter is also committed to trying to provide that data um, for uh, forms of replicability, which is a really uh, interesting move, but we've also seen how challenging that can be in this space if you think about the sort of social science one initiative that has gotten stymied by um, uh, sort of privacy constraints. So uh, tell us a little bit more about how, how Twitter or you are thinking about that kind of data access uh, uh, problem uh, um, that Irina points out. Yeah, that's a, a great question. I'm glad you sort of put it into two parts because they are actually two parts of the same question. So for the first part of the question, it's uh, I'll, I'll put on my startup hat when I had my my algorithmic auditing startups actually a pretty common uh, concern and it's valid, you know, and, and we're not just talking about big corporations and small people. Let's also put it in the context of um, mergers and acquisitions or vendor relationships. If I am a big corporation and I want to assess the ethical, the you know, the uh, it, whether or not there's algorithmic bias in a vendor, a vendor's models that I want to work with, right? Uh, for example, let's think of any major tech company licensing any recruiting company, uh, all of which are using machine learning and AI models. Um, what's to stop this big company if they have access to all of their code and IP from just replicating the work themselves? That's a genuine fear. It's actually a genuine fear a lot of startups have. Um, and there is no good and easy answer for that. And actually, it is very related to the second question is how do you meaningfully share data and information? Um, it is something I'm actually working on with this VC fund that I've started, Parity Responsible Innovation Fund. Um, what we are focusing on is uh, is investing in the companies that build the backbone, uh, you know, the tech, the technical backbone, uh, the, and the responsible ML infrastructure for companies, which includes privacy and security, compliance and ethics, transparency and explainability. Um, but to answer the question specifically about Twitter, I very much wish I could talk about it, but I can't yet uh, because we've not yet signed all the contracts. Um, but it, you know, we are extremely. Uh, hopeful that we will be able to say something soon. But yes, you are, your assessment is correct. Our goal is to be able to ensure replicability of findings as a start and hopefully more. And, you know, we, we are a little bit, um, you know, in, in uh, cutting edge technical ground. So really hopeful that that's something we can be more public about very soon. So Roman, I'd love to follow up a little bit on the, the amplification of certain kinds of information on uh, Twitter, political views you mentioned also, um, there was a, a paper in Science that, that I'm sure you know by Dave Roy, your colleague, and, and Sinan Aral, one of my uh, students, and, and uh, Vasogi, um, that looked at uh, misinformation and the spread of truth and false news. And one of the interesting things that came from that, um, there are a lot of things that came out of it, was that even when they took the bots out and they tried to remove the, the automated amplification by some of the bots, humans themselves tended to amplify misinformation more than truth. Uh, I guess misinformation is juicier and you know more fun to to, to talk about because um, it's it had more emotional valence. 
Yep. And so part of the problem seemed to be us ourselves that we were we were more likely to spread false news than than truth. So maybe say a little bit about you know why it is that certain types of news, certain types of political views, certain types of information get spread more. How much of it is due to the algorithms? How much of it is due to people? And 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 you know, yeah, those trade offs. Yeah, no, that, that's, and you're raising a really great point. Frankly, one of the most interesting parts of my job is the human aspect, right? So um, that's what we're embarking on over the next year is you know, in our blog post, we talk about the what and the why. So in our paper, we've identified the what, what is happening, what's the phenomenon we saw, and then our next step is to figure out why it's happening. And to your point about, you know, your research, which was, you know, the research you cited, which is very important, you know, I would actually ask from a policy perspective, what does one do? I would be very, very, very uncomfortable to say, well, we're going to enforce some notion of equitable discourse, even though it is human action and human behavior that is, that is uh, you know, making this happen and is not a technical byproduct of an algorithm. I'd be extremely uncomfortable doing that. And, you know, and again, thinking through, of, let's make sure well, we're not passing- Let me push, push back on that a little bit. I mean, I, I can see being uncomfortable on enforcing different political views, but isn't part of your job to have a platform that that um, it, you know amplifies truth more than than falsehoods? And don't you think there are any yes, parameters so, you can do on that? Correct. Yeah, correct. So I was drawing the link between like certain things get amplified more, not necessarily misinformation. If something is cut and dry, not factual, that is a much easier problem to solve. But what do you do when it is an amplification of someone's opinion that is maybe you know something that is yeah. something that a bunch of people just don't like? Um, you know, and what, what we looked at very specifically wasn't misinformation, right? It's just sort of politicians on different sides of the playing field and who's getting more amplification. And I will also add that we saw center right, not far right. So we saw more center right amplification than we saw center left amplification. So we are talking about the middle of the road people getting mm -hmm. amplified. And again, figuring out why, like if it is simply because they just engage better on social media, yeah. Again, I don't know the answer, but if that is the answer, then we have a much more complex question yeah. to discuss. Absolutely. No, it is. And one thing I've, a term I've learned uh, is nut picking. You, you know that term? Mm -hmm. So but now that I, I, I've learned the term, I see it all the time on so all kinds of social media. Nut picking is kind of the opposite of cherry picking, where you find like an extreme nutcase on the other side. And you make them famous. You know, somebody who might have been ranting on the subway oh, or something normally would have two or three people notice them, but suddenly they have millions or hundreds of millions of people who know about this craziness. And, and it's not false. It's, it actually really happened, but it becomes a, a great tool for stoking polarization. That is one of the theories that when we posted the paper, a lot of folks were in my Twitter feed saying this is they're like, oh, it's because the left quote tweets more than the right. As mm -hmm. it's to your point, like people on the left tend to find an account that saying something absolutely ridiculous and then retweet and quote tweet it to say how ridiculous it is, that too feeds into amplifying. You are amplifying when you do that. Even if you are amplifying that you dislike it, it is still an amplification. So yeah, absolutely. Now that I know that term, um, but yeah, there is some thought. You see it everywhere now. It's one of those now, things now, that, now I yeah. feel like I'm just, thank you for introducing me to it. But yeah, and, and these are the complexities to untangle and the incredibly interesting and rich body of work that comprises Responsible AI. Well, thanks. Uh, let me uh, pose another question uh, coming out of the, the Slido. Um, a, a few years ago, you discussed the danger of how anthropomorphization of AI leads to moral outsourcing that you mentioned um, in your talk, shifting the blame from humans to machines. Can you describe a bit more uh, sort of what you mean by that and whether you think we're moving in the right direction? Um, overall, I would say yes, I think we are moving in the right direction. So when I gave that talk was years ago, and it was speaking more to sort of the deific, well, we are better, we're not great. It, it's what I worry is that we don't talk about these things like tools and products, we talk about them like these godlike things. The world has gotten much better. I see much fewer, you know, Hal and Terminator and Ex Machina references in policy papers than I used to. <laughs> very, very grateful for that. Uh, but that being said, there is still sort of like we talk about the algorithm as it is an ent as as if as if it is an entity in the room. We talk about it as if it is this like godlike, all-knowing creature. But none of this is true. We are talking about systems made by people. The new face of moral outsourcing that I'm seeing is the one I alluded to, and you know, again, it is progress, but it is you know shifting. Where when ethics teams exist, 
folks who work in product are like, well, this is what you guys are for. Like, we're not, we don't have to worry about this anymore. And again, that's a common issue faced with legal, security, privacy. You know, it is not something a single team can do. It is a company-wide thing. Everybody has their role to play. Uh, we may be the experts and we're not the ones executing everything. Um, so yes, it is better, but I've also seen an evolution of what that term means. Uh, yeah, one last uh, closing question. I know you got to run to give a, a, another talk. Um, Susan Etlinger asked, um, what, would, what would you say have been the most effective strategies to demonstrate to your peers engineering that responsible or ethical use of AI in industry is a business benefit mm -hmm. and not a tax, something that, that is kind of a win-win? Great question. And hi, Susan. Um, it's, it's framing us as improving quality. Um, and framing us as people who are working with them versus people who are working against them. Uh, I've pushed back against this notion of the fairness versus accuracy trade-off, which has become a bit of a language in the data science community that is quite wrong. Um, do, you know, can have a whole separate conversation about that, uh, but it is about you know, being a good engineer. It is about be building better quality products. I've also been talking about this notion of ethical debt, similar to technical debt, right? If you do not address these issues now, then trying to address them after the fact is significantly harder, if not sometimes impossible. And one may have to tank the entire system if it is significantly too complex to identify where problems are coming from and what you can do about them. So those would be my three strategies. Well, thanks so much, uh, Raman. I know you have to, to run and we're so grateful for uh, you, uh, your sharing these uh, really interesting thoughts uh, with us. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, um, well, uh, we're gonna move on to our uh, first proposal for today. So please let me introduce uh, Dr. Jennifer King. Jen is the Privacy and Data Policy Fellow here at Stanford High, where she researches online privacy, our expectations of data privacy, and the policy implications of emerging technologies. Uh, she has a PhD in Information Science from Berkeley School of Information, and uh, was previously the Director of Consumer Privacy at the Center for Internet and Society uh, at Stanford Law School. Uh, Jen, whenever you're ready. Great, thank you, Dan. Can you all hear me okay? Yep. yep. Great. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so good morning. Our session today is going to start by discussing a proposal that is really at the vanguard of rethinking our personal and societal relationships to the data we produce, both individually and in together with others, that is in turn collected, analyzed, monetized, and potentially sold by businesses, often without our express knowledge and consent. We all know today that data comprises a significant part of the economy. But with the development of AI, data is poised to become even more important to the development of technology. To that end, there is a growing group of thinkers working to reimagine our relationships to data from a personal, societal, and a corporate perspective. Today, we'll debate a proposal that is specifically attempting to rebalance the division of power between data producers and data collectors through something called a data collective. And to that end, I'm pleased to introduce Divya Siddharth. She's an associate political economist and social technologist at Microsoft and a visiting scholar at the Ostrom Workshop and the Radical Exchange Foundation. Divya's work includes promoting and preserving the digital commons, building the technology and policy infrastructure for data collaboratives, and devising frameworks for collectively focused rather than centrally concentrated AI. Today, Divya will discuss data ownership and whether data collectives can give us more power over the personal information that big tech collects and uses about us. Divya, please share your screen and begin. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Thank you, Jen. It's great to be here and such an honor to share the stage today and over this conference with truly leading lights in this space. Um, I think this session has been wonderfully set up by earlier conversations from middleware, which as Katrina Leggett pointed out, is an opening for the data cooperative approach um, to UBI and the view of AI it entails, which I'll push back against a bit today. And, you know, the incredible talk by Ruman we just heard. So I'm excited to be in conversation with those approaches uh, and hopefully to put forward some of my answers to the homework that Eric so generously assigned at the beginning of this conference. Uh, so with that, I think we should start with a phrase that I'm sure we've all heard, data is the new oil. I recently learned that this was coined by Clive Humvee in 2006, but I think we can probably blame the Economist 2017 article stating that data had replaced oil as the world's most valuable resource for kind of the canonization of this phrase. 
And I'm not the first to call attention to the things this misses by any stretch of the imagination, but let's take a different tactic at first and look at what data as the new oil gets right. First, data is valuable. It is, and there is no getting around it, and increasingly so, as an input into large-scale AI systems and economy-wide processes of technological investment and innovation. Second, data takes a lot of infrastructure for capture, cleaning, and transfer. Infrastructure that needs to be built and funded uh, and regulated across the public and private sectors, often with big, large-scale projects. In fact, much like Standard Oil had a monopoly on oil refinement, we have a monopolized and captured landscape for data refinement and transfer as well, one that is ripe for scrutiny in much the same way Standard Oil was. And third, disputes over data ownership, use, sovereignty are increasingly matters of national and international concern, building tensions over technological interdependence and driving state and regional agendas. Access to data is sometimes looked at as a question of national security and national technology agendas as much as it is a domestic economic input. So we can see there's some truth to data as the new oil. But data as the new oil does miss a lot of things, and rather than miss, actually misconstrue in a way that has real effects on how we think about and regulate data. First, what is data? The word encompasses everything from huge data sets that capture the web browsing data of millions to hospital records that may contain information on some of the most difficult events of people's lives. We can't look at both of these things the same way and we shouldn't, and we can't use or protect them the same way either. So you can't just trade out one data set for another. It's highly context specific, non-fungible, and needs to be protected and governed as such flexibly and with individual and community choice. Right now, the law focuses largely on two kinds of data, personal information, like our social security numbers, and intellectual property, copyrights, and patents. But the data as the new oil era didn't come about due to one of these. It's talking about another kind of data, sometimes called data exhaust, the data that we generate and is now captured as we move through the world. Data like where we go, what we buy, who we talk to, what we write, who we swipe right on, and even what temperatures we set our homes at. Data like this isn't just used to sell us ads anymore either, but also used to train algorithms that may have decision-making power over us or even try to emulate our intellectual capacities. This kind of data that we're focusing on is subject to network effects that natural resources obviously aren't. In terms of productive use, data is only really meaningful and valuable in the aggregate, incentivizing the monopolized data collection that we're seeing. One person's Facebook data is valued at like seven cents, I believe, and all Facebook users' data is valued at Facebook, I mean, tens of billions of dollars, one study found that Facebook earned roughly $110 from each American user. And going back to the things that data is used for, these applications come from having access to vast quantities of data, and ideally also good quality data, but the current ecosystem does often trade quality for quantity, as we'll see. And this comes with an agenda. Most of this data is also fundamentally collective. Going back to that same Facebook data, if I made a post and a friend likes that post, can we say the post is mine, but the like separate from the post is hers? If I send an email and you respond, who could own which piece of that interaction and who owns the metadata? The kinds of data we produce now are very difficult to assign to individuals. And given the network effects, my data is mostly valuable because it can be used to predict the behavior of people I associate with. So data is highly networked and interdependent and very collective at this stage, this type of data. And third, maybe most importantly, this data isn't just a latent resource, isn't exhaust, isn't oil lying in the ground for capture. It's actively created through interaction, sociality, and labor. It's a product of collective work, not some millennia old natural process. And this is particularly relevant when we think about the data that trains AI systems. Large scale models like GPT-3 aren't autonomous AI achievements, entirely the opposite. These projects only work because they're trained on hundreds of billions of words words written by humans, capturing centuries of human knowledge, thought, and insight, everything from books to Wikipedia articles. So we have these ways that data is not the new oil, and what do we do with these insights? Well, we can't treat data as individual private property because the nature of data is highly networked and interdependent, and also because we already see the empirical failure of devolving responsibility to the individual in terms of preserving their own privacy and security, which has basically become a, an unsustainable initial here, please kind of model. And while privacy itself is crucial, we can't assume that all interests in data are privacy interests alone. I may have very legitimate financial or control interests in my data that extend way beyond my privacy concerns. 
and communities that produce data may also have these concerns beyond the individual, which is especially true if that data is also being used to train very powerful AI systems that may then be used on that very community. And it's also not clear the regulatory schemes alone, not to say they aren't an irreplaceable piece of the puzzle, are even sufficient to meaningfully protect privacy when the incentives in the space tend so much against it and the burden of being privacy conscious is still largely on the individual. And we on the opposite side certainly shouldn't rush into building data marketplaces, hoping that they'll enable competition and increase efficiency in the productive use of data. The balance of power is so skewed with individual and data holders holding so little of it, that this would certainly result in even more entrenched inequality, particularly for the most vulnerable. It would be like the state of working conditions before both worker protections and strong collective bargaining laws, which is really not something we should return to. So this brings us to the data cooperative approach. And the fundamental thing that sets data cooperatives apart is that this is a collective approach to the stewardship of this data. It's an approach that understands that one, the data we produce by moving through the world isn't exhaust, it's valuable and it's the product of work. And two, most of this data is collective and it's most productive and most accountable when it's treated that way. Data like this cannot be owned, but it absolutely must be governed. And the way that data cooperatives do this is by forming a new technical and institutional layer that would exist between those that have data and those that use it, doing all the things that we're missing right now, mediating data flows, governing data use, reuse, storage and transfer, preserving privacy, and also building the high quality data sets we increasingly need to enable competition and unlock innovation. Take a moment on this handy diagram for which I've got to thank Matt Pruitt and the Radical Exchange Data Working Group, uh, which lays out a microcosm of what this could look like. So on the data holder side at the bottom, you've got both individuals and organizational forms. And these data holder entities have two-way contracts with one or more data cooperatives. You can imagine one is on health data, where another is on web browsing data broadly. Some are just for individuals and some work with other entities. The cooperative will have a fiduciary responsibility over this data to act in the best interests of the data holder as defined in the contract. And they'll represent those interests to the platforms up top. This solves the principal agent pro problem of the current platform economy because these cooperatives can represent individuals to platforms rather than platforms basically playing both sides. But they don't just represent interests one way. They also provide valuable data and insights to these platforms, higher quality data than what's currently provided, and not just to the existing big platforms that hold all of this data now, but to a bunch of other entities that need curated data sets for a range of activities, like driving data for self-driving cars. So they're providing value to platforms as well as to data holders. And cooperatives might have trade-offs because people face trade-offs with data. So some co-ops might be very privacy focused. They don't share data with most entities. Their work is really grounded in preserving privacy. And others may be more monetization focused and with a different kind of data where they're all about making sure their data holders get a fair deal on all the data labor that they're doing that companies are already benefiting from. Or maybe they represent the exploited data workers that underpin a lot of these systems now. Um, so for example, take me. Say I'm thinking about going to do a PhD, which I am. And so maybe I'm anticipating budgets getting a little tight. And I'm more interested in trying to monetize some of my data where I can. I already wear a Fitbit. And so I join a health data cooperative that licenses that data from members to a healthcare company to use it to develop better indications and predictions of cardiovascular health. This is high quality and verified data. And sometimes I even answer questions about it for them with my running group, all of whom have joined, making it particularly valuable to that company and to me. But I still don't wanna share a bunch of the other data I have, like my messaging data. So I make sure to join another data co-op that's very privacy focused, that not only protects the data that my phone gathers on my messages, but actually uses its leverage since millions of people feel similarly about this data to advocate for better privacy and security practices on those devices generally. And it actually has the power to do that because of these collective bargaining rights. And then not to get ahead of myself, I managed to finish the PhD, head back into the world. I'm no longer so interested in spending my time on the data monetization side. Well, in the current ecosystem, once a platform holds your data, that's it. They can resell it and reuse it with no safeguards. But the data co-op approach has one crucial design feature. It does not allow permanent alienation from data. So you can't sell your data. You can only lease it for short-term periods of time. So this preserves the option of actually changing my preferences if they change over time and having trust that they'll be followed. Now, this of course requires a significant amount of regulation and oversight and technical capacity in the data cooperatives. 
Some of this could be done through something like a data relations board modeled after the labor relations board. There need to be guardrails on data co-ops that pre prevent them from being predatory and exploitative, similar to the kinds of guardrails being proposed for the predatory and exploitative platforms we already have. We need ways for data cooperatives to make horizontal claims on each other, right? Given that the collective nature of this data as we've discussed, so it doesn't result in a race to the bottom scenario where the least privacy focus set the terms of engagement. There also needs to be an enforced separation between entities that are cooperatives and entities that use data. Otherwise, the cooperative is refereeing both sides of a case. You can't just have Google try to incubate an internal data cooperative startup and then negotiate with itself. This has to be prevented. And it's not just regulation of the co-ops that is necessary, but also things like portability, interoperability, privacy regulation, as well as data labor regulation, the kinds of things without which this all won't work that's necessary from the policy and the technical side. So what will it take to get here? I'm not going to pretend that it doesn't take effort. It will take some active involvement in the governance of our data, although delegation paradigms and the collective approach can help. There's definitely governance involved. It takes advocacy to get the legislation necessary to enshrine the centrality of data cooperatives to the use of data. This has to be something that you have to go through to use data for it to work and to assign cooperatives as accountable intermediaries and regulate them and to enshrine these rights to privacy and interoperability that are necessary. It takes careful understanding of technological feasibility and compliance, as Ruman mentioned in her talk. We have to be able to do the things that the legislation says we can do and some open space for cooperatives to experiment with different tech technical approaches. It will take trial and error as different cooperative models exist in the same ecosystem alongside organizations like data trusts and data commons, and they all find ways to work together to achieve their goals. And we find ways to ensure that bad actors don't gain prominence. And you might ask, well, data co-ops are not a new idea. This has been tossed around for a long time. Uh, many people have worked on it. Why well, believe they'll work now? The reason I believe that this is both radical and feasible as a conference calls for is that we now have so many of these ingredients in place. First, more data cooperatives than ever already exist, a fast growing number of them. There are data co-ops that follow the health data for research paradigm we talked about earlier, like Salus and My Data. There are co-ops that aim to monetize data like Streamer and Pool and Citizen Me, which allows consumers to get paid for data they share with companies with millions of data exchanges completed. And there are existing organizations that already serve communities or groups in other capacities that also function as co-ops like driver's seat, a driver's workers cooperative that returns profit from aggregate data to their workers. And this really shows us that existing organizations like credit unions and worker co-ops can adopt data cooperative functionality fairly easily. And in fact, already have, they already have that trust with members and those kinds of relationships that can be transferred into acting in this kind of intermediary function. And on the regulatory side, pieces of legislation like the Data Governance Act and India's non-personal data proposal do point us in the direction of these sorts of intermediaries, although they don't go far enough in terms of some of the delegation of rights, things that would be necessary. And finally, technology is catching up to what's necessary to allow data cooperatives to work. And this gives me a ton of hope. So this licensing function is only really possible with technologies that allow us to share insights from data without sharing the underlying data like federated learning and new privacy techniques like differential privacy. Approaches to tackling data lineage while not a solved problem are becoming much more sophisticated. So that ability to really put our money where our mouth is in a lot of ways enshrine things in legislation that are actually doable in practice is gr growing quickly. So yes, making data cooperatives a necessary and accountable intermediary for a majority of data transactions will take some work. It will take research. It will take experimentation. It will take legislation. But what do we take get in return? Well, here's what we think. We think you get much more effective advocacy around things like data privacy, because those asks come from a place of leverage as well as regulation. You get to exert and benefit from the financial and control interests over your data that are just being swept under the table now. You get a trustworthy ecosystem that has functional accountability measures. You get to benefit from a diverse set of applications and services that spring up in this opened up ecosystem, moving from monopolies to companies that solve real problems and leverage your work to do it. And as this data is used to underpin pioneering AI models, you get to be an active, recognized, and compensated participant, sharing insights and expertise and experience rather than being essentially scraped into providing that knowledge and then totally cut out of the benefits and the new economy created. Really, this also means we get to move from a vision of the future that aims for large scale autonomous AI 
to one that acknowledges and takes strength and innovation from the contributions of people to existing AI systems and to making them better. This leverages the vast amount of collective knowledge and experience and insight and wisdom that we have and incorporates it intentionally into the technology that we build, exponentiating the reach and ambition of that technology while regenerating and elevating the human contributions that make this collective and not artificial intelligence possible. Great, thank you, Divya. Is that your last slide? It is. All right, great. Thank you. So we are now going to move into a panel discussion um, and I will introduce both of our two panelists uh, who will each get about two to three minutes to respond to Divya's talk and then we'll move into a set of questions. So first I will start, start with Professor Pamela Samuelson. Pam is the Richard M. Sherman Distinguished Professor of Law at UC Berkeley Law and the co-director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. She is a pioneer in digital copyright law, intellectual property, cyber law, and information policy. Alex Sandy Pentland is the Toshiba Professor of Media Arts and Sciences and the Professor of Information Technology at MIT Management Sloan School. He is on the board of the UN Foundation's Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, and he co-led the World Economic Forum's discussion in Davos that eventually led to the EU privacy regulation, regulation the GDPR. He also helped forge the transparency and accountability mechanisms in the UN, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Welcome both of you. And Pam, why don't you please get us kicked off? Well, thanks very much for the opportunity to be here. I uh, really enjoyed uh, reading the Data Freedom Act, which uh, is the, uh, the more elaborate proposal that, um, uh, that Divya was uh, speaking about. And there are some really interesting insights in that. Uh, in that um, document about individuals not being well situated to negotiate with the firms that they uh, now give data to, um, and you can't do it one at a time, um, and uh, over the terms or the uses that can be made, value of data lies in uh, collections, not just in individual um, data as to a particular individuals, and some sort of collective rights management um, seems to be something that would give more leverage uh, to uh, negotiate with some of these firms. And um, the idea that there would be a number of different types of uh, cooperatives uh, so that I have a preference for this and I have a preference for that and I can join whatever co cooperative that uh, that meets my uh, my needs. So I think that's really interesting. And of course, uh, there needs to be some responsibility uh, on the on these uh, cooperative as intermediaries uh, uh, because um, they will be handling some very sensitive uh, information. So at 30,000 feet, I think this is a really cool idea. Um, uh, the devil as always is in the details. Uh, and it seems to me that the details are actually um, uh, a little concerning. So one thing is that um, uh, this kind of imagines a world in which there are um, whole new businesses uh, created. And I don't know where the startup money comes from uh, for that. Um, and how do you get uh, people to join it? And also what is the leverage uh, that these uh, cooperatives would have um, when they are like small um, uh, with respect to larger entities. Um, one can imagine that if there was a consent decree, for example, for an, in an antitrust case, that um, agreeing to negotiate with um, data cooperatives would be something, but I don't know where the duty to negotiate uh, comes from uh, other than um, uh, that. And the firms all today already have a whole bunch of our data and they ain't gonna give it up uh, and uh, they won't wanna give up either their opportunity to have uh, a direct relationship with, uh, with people. Um, and there is, um, you know, a kind of who, who's gonna start this kind of stuff, right? In some sense, labor unions grew out of laborers being concerned. Uh, farmers cooperatives grew out of farmers needing to have some cooperative. But um, I, I think generally speaking, most people who are privacy people, they don't wanna start a new cooperative and that's not what their goal is. Um, and so who is gonna do it um, and where are they gonna get the money is a big deal. Um, and uh, there also is kind of a network effects problem here too, it seems to me, uh, because um, uh, the sort of the 
platforms uh, that you want them to negotiate with um, will only want to do business with the ones that are really big. Um, and so uh, it's not clear how the, the ones that are going to be highly uh, privacy protective uh, are in fact going to be able to make enough money to actually uh, make this um, uh, workable. And so um, it seems to me that the incentive is going to be to try to maximize the amount of um, maximize the amount of commodification of this uh, data uh, to get more money into the hands of, uh, of individuals. Um, and it seems to me that um, also it doesn't think about what could go wrong. Uh, now, the biggest thing that can go wrong um, is here's the place where all the data is. And hackers basically think, hey, that's like where the money is. Um, uh, when Willie Horton said, why do you rob banks? Um, uh, and it's a, a, a vulnerability and it's already really hard to keep cybersecurity happening. Uh, so that's another vulnerability. Uh, also, a lot of um, cooperative organizations, collective rights management organizations have well-known um, sort of difficulties uh, really um, uh, in terms of act actually representing uh, the interests of their uh, members. So um, it does seem to me that, you know, there are already some uh, kind of trusted institutions like uh, banks, cloud providers, libraries, and schools. Um, maybe they could form some cooperatives, but um, I just, uh, I found myself just not sure where we're gonna where we're gonna go uh, with this. Um, and so uh, while I, I like the idea, um, it seems to me this is a tougher thing to bring about uh, than uh, Divya was uh, suggesting. Uh, it may be a better idea to go the route of making the platforms into information fiduciaries the way that Jack Balkan has uh, suggested um, and conditioning their section 230 immunity uh, from liability for what their users do uh, on their willingness to take on this fiduciary role. So sorry not to be able to kind of like say, oh yeah, let's do it. But um, uh, I think there's some real serious reservations here. Thank you, Pam. Sandy, can you give us your thoughts? Sure. Um, well, a little like Pam, I, at the top level, yay. Um, but I disagree with a number of the uh, uh, the more detailed things. I mean, for the first of all, uh, passing a new law is tough, and I don't think it's necessary. We have a, a fairly uh, sizable legal team working with consumer union to be able to, as I say, weaponize the California law and the EU laws uh, so that the fiduciary mechanism is completely automatic and irresistible in the legal sense. And I think that's well along and it will happen. That doesn't mean there isn't a need for law, but you can get these cooperatives going without it and that's what we're doing. And in fact, the, the second piece is um, this term coalitions. So one of the things that's wrong about writing regulation or having a mission statement that maximizes something like the best medical treatment or whatever is externalities. You, you can't maximize everything without considering everything. And um, I am a strong believer that you can't do everything digitally, which is why I think that these have to start with physical neighborhoods where people can say, yeah, you could do that, but wouldn't that hurt the schools? Or yeah, you could do that, but then what about X, Y, and Z? Um, you have to be able to talk about the holistic person, not sort of thin slices of people. And so um, as Pamela was suggesting, what uh, we've done is we have put together a network of the U.S.'s 1,200 federally certified um, uh, community development financial institutions to be able to hold data for their members. Uh, so these are typically not-for-profit, member-owned uh, things that give loans to people in the community. And they're not big enough to have a, be a force by themselves, but if you put all of them together, you get uh, fairly big 
slice of the, of the uh, US population. In fact, if you put all of the, those sort of institutions together, you get something like 50% of the population. And if you show up with 100 million people, people will listen to you. So, so the idea is that each of the CDFIs, these community development things, are not powerful enough to have the tech savvy to do this. But they are a place where people can talk about what does our community want, where they can see each other and express uh, their voices in what they want and how they want their data to be used. And by having a network of them to spread expertise and create sort of joint movements, well, that echoes the labor movement. That echoes the way agricultural banks changed uh, banking law. It's, it's a coalition of the local communities that can make this happen. And I think that we're um, coming along pretty nicely at that, right? I mean, in terms of actually making that happen. Um, it's particularly interesting in countries like the UK, where you have legal structures like councils, uh, uh, which have an elected body to represent the community, and again, the legal authority to help manage data for them. And we're in discussions with 10 Downing Street to, to see how they can take these same sort of ideas. Another part about having it be sort of local is that um, you really don't want to go after just money. The money is actually the small part of the whole picture. What I want is I want good medical care for my family. I also want good governance. I also want opportunities and schooling. And a couple hundred dollars from the, you know, uh, Google and Facebook would be nice. But it's not important compared to those other sorts of things. Um, and that's the sort of thing that I think local communities can be very good at advocating for if they have the data. Currently, local communities don't know what's happening in their community because the data is all centralized. Not just by these big companies, but by governments, by national institutions and things like that, which leaves communities relatively powerless. I was glad that you mentioned federated learning because, in fact, you don't have to move the data. And, in fact, you shouldn't move the data. That's crazy to, to try and make data lakes. I, I always tell people, if you were involved in setting up a data lake, you should be fired, which you can imagine gets interesting reactions in a commercial audience. But it's, but it's true. And um, I sort of like the thing also that, Pamela, that, that Divya said at the end about collective intelligence, but I want to uh, change that slightly. I want to call it community intelligence. Communities able to advocate for themselves based on facts, which requires that they know what's happening to them, that they have data, and that they have the tools to be able to understand that data and make advocacy. And my existence proof is the way that community banks turned into the modern banking system, individual agricultural banks joined together, the way labor movements, which were local to begin with, remember, eventually joined up nationally to be able to have national level effects. So I'll just stop there. Thank you, Sandy. So um, it's interesting, you know, I hear a kind of, obviously some disagreements in the details, but maybe some commonalities in the sense that we all agree that there is perhaps something wrong with the status quo. And I want to dig into that in a few more minutes. But first, Divya, do you have any responses that you'd like to give us on any of those particular points that Pam or Sandy made? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. And I think these are these are the questions, right? I mean, these are the questions we need to ask ourselves uh, if we're trying to go with this approach. And so I'm really grateful for that input. Um, I think I I, uh, Sandy already said this, but I think it's absolutely a huge risk to kind of collect huge pools of data. And so we should not do it. Uh, and I think that's part of the reason actually that I think that data cooperatives are more possible now than they have been in the past because we're really building what is new technology to be able to do those kinds of things. Um, Pammy also brought up sort of how do we do this, right? Where does the money come from? Uh, leverage when data co-ops are small? I think these are all real questions. And I think there are a couple of different ways that this could happen. I mean, one, we could start with sector specific data and so particularly valuable and needing to be protected data like health data and kind of go from there. 
uh, we could work with cooperatives that already exist. Sandy brought this up multiple times. I mean, there are a lot of organizations that could transition easily into being accountable data intermediaries with very little outside intervention. And I think that's why I mentioned credit unions, uh, worker co-ops as kind of being part of this, this project. And I think that it's, it's actually true to Sandy's point though, that, you know, he, you mentioned we can't do everything digitally and absolutely we shouldn't do everything digitally and governance, it can be a very in-person process. However, I think as much as we belong strongly to our neighborhoods and communities and our worker co-ops and our credit unions and our rural electrification boards and all of these kinds of things, we may also strongly belong now to digital native local communities. In fact, wonderful self-governance paradigms are coming up in wholly online communities from subreddits to growing organizational forms coming out of the decentralized tech space. So I think when we're talking about Pam's question, you know, converting things that already exist into data cooperatives without huge amounts of change in the law or having to, you know, change incentive structures too much, we can talk about that in both offline and online communities and hopefully build ways for those communities to build off the leverage of each other, right? And have collective power in this distributed and federated sense, Sandy, that you were talking about, where it's not one 100 million strong data co-op taking on Facebook. It's a lot of smaller cooperatives with different kinds of data, with more locally owned data, with certain kinds of digital online community data that band together and have that power because they're collective in that sense, rather than being really large. So I really do think that, you know, these are important questions. There are questions about rights over data and privacy that need to be figured out that are, are unanswered even currently in the legislation. There are questions around the types of institutions that would lend themselves to this best. Um, but I do think between the technical progress, the fact that data co-ops already exist means that it's possible to do this without any lift at all because they exist, right? And so it's that question of taking that and making it a much more necessary intermediary. And I, I do think Jen's right. We, we all agree that, you know, the current model of this is unworkable it's skewed it's not helping the technology it's definitely not helping people and it's really opaque and i think data co-ops are one of the best ways we have to solve that which isn't easy and if i wanted if i wanted data cooperatives to work i wouldn't start where we are like this isn't an ideal starting point for any solution to the data economy but this is the starting point we have and i think this this model of data cooperatives is a possible way to get us to a better future thank you Divya. so I actually, I want to pose the first question to you, um, just in terms of thinking through, uh, you know, obviously we're here to talk about AI. And so I really want to lead with uh, a question that thinks more explicitly about AI for a second, and then we'll touch on some other pieces of the proposal. Um, but, you know, as we both said, AI is really completely dependent on data. Um, without data, you can't feed AI. Um, and so today, you know, the status quo is that we see many large technology platforms that have a, an advantage in the marketplace because of the access to data that they've collected over time, in some cases now, you know, at more than two decades. Um, and so your proposal really is focused on redistributing power away from those large companies and towards individuals, um, and presumably also to give smaller actors access to the marketplace, because it's not just the individuals here that are disadvantaged. Uh, potentially, it's small business businesses too, who, and startups who want to actually work in this area, who can't get access to data. And the incentives for data collection are often such that we see them plundering the public sphere in a way that makes sense rationally, because that's what they have access to, even though it presents horrible uh, concerns to me personally around privacy. So can you just talk for a minute, how will your proposal give individuals more direct participation in AI development? And or, you know, just speak to us more again about how you think that this rebalancing of power away from data monopolies and more towards individuals and other actors, um, really how it benefits the space. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, of course, there will be some large platforms that lose power in this situation. That's sort of the point. But I think so many other organizations, as you pointed out, small and medium enterprises, organizations that want to build incredible things on top of data and don't have access to it, individuals, communities, um, countries that currently, you know, really are beholden to data monopolies and are built in other spaces will gain that I think we can hopefully forestall these challenges with broad support. And in an age where we're talking about solutions like antitrust and company breakup, uh, I think even large platforms may realize that this democratization approach serves them better than alternatives. And I think in terms of participation, the core here is that people create AI and should be able to share in the benefits. And so for example, you can imagine that if cooperative data is used to train an algorithm, they have ongoing claim over the revenue and, and perhaps even the direction of that project. 
which shifts AI from the centralizing and top-down project to something that really involves communities and individuals. And I think this could precipitate a move that many are already calling for, that smaller and higher quality data sets actually lead to better AI outcomes than the current sort of kitchen sink approach and may even address some of the major issues around fairness and bias that we see. And so this kind of science that we could do with this data could be incredibly important to our future. Tackling collective problems like climate change is going to require vast amounts of data. And we're going to need and want input and consent and participation on that. And really the only other option for tracking some things is heavy surveillance and, and we need another way. Thank you. Pam or Sandy, do you either of you have a response to that before? Yeah, so the, the vision I have is, um, you know, imagine, uh, first of all, the reason to start with co-ops and stuff is so that co-ops can actually do a better job at what they're currently doing um, when they have more data about who their members are and what the members want. So in the case of these community development financial institutions, they can get cheaper loan rates, better terms, by knowing something about their community so that they can bargain for better uh, uh, terms. But now let's imagine that there's a network of these, which is in fact something that we're building. Um, and you could show up to you know, some uh, uh, company like Facebook and say, we have 100 million people and we don't like you doing X. And Facebook could say, well, it's too bad, right? Um, but those 100 million people and this network could say, well, we're putting out a request for proposal for another company that doesn't do these obnoxious things. And what we will do is just turn off the data to Facebook. And we'll turn on the data to that other. And because it's our data, there's no history ramp up problem, right? You already have a copy of your data. You can spin up competition very easily. Um, and, and that sort of thing is pretty amazing. So it works in many domains when the switching costs are low and when you can have an aggregate expression that it's worth switching. And so the fact that community organizations would maintain a copy of their data, that they could among themselves decide what criteria they want, would give them great negotiating power in uh, competing visions of the sort of services that they want. And I think that's actually where a lot of this comes from. So the money comes from them being able to do what they currently do, but much better. And I think the, the change in the ecosystem comes from them being able to plausibly uh, uh, enforce or make available switching between providers. And uh, that seems to be a pretty good idea. Interestingly, the big companies that I talk to are not against this. They don't find this super threatening. They'd rather get rid of the liability of holding data. They need to know more about their customers to deliver better services. Um, so the way to do that is to get the, the customers to ask for what they want which is this sort of idea that the customers have the ability to be able to request what they want, to be able to provide uh, minimal data resources to achieve that, and then the companies will be able to provide services that meet that. And, and that's the way you know big banks, uh, other sorts of things, see this picture. They don't see it as we're monopolists in control. Now, Facebook and Google might be different, because they're so powerful. Uh, but most of the mid-sized companies um, don't see it as something that it's a bad way to go. Thank you, Sandy. Pam, I, my next question is for you, but do you, did you want to comment on any of that before we move on? I, mean, I, I do think that um, there is some benefit uh, from uh, data being open uh, these days, and there's a huge movement to make data uh, uh, open in a way that uh, it wasn't uh, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and so uh, while um, uh, the idea of 
mitigating the power of some of these uh, platforms is uh, uh, is one that appeals to to many of us, uh, and um, uh, the idea of uh, making uh, these firms more responsible uh, toward data is uh, a really good one. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, uh, that open data and free data actually is something that benefits uh, startups. Uh, so so uh, that seems to me to be something that uh, we're not kind of recognizing is, is that um, I think that to, to commoditize all data in order to get some more money to individuals um, uh, is missing some part of the benefit uh, of the open data uh, movement uh, of the day. So I don't want to I don't want to move into a kind of let's commodify everything um, uh, and make all those places pay up when sometimes uh, everybody benefits, um, especially in the kind of the health uh, data area. It seems to me uh, that I want to make my uh, data available to people who are doing research to solve a uh, disease problem. And we wouldn't have the vaccine uh, development that we that we saved many of us from uh, dying uh, if there hadn't been uh, open sharing uh, of data and of uh, insights uh, in the, among scientists in this area. So it seems to me data sharing uh, is something that at least has some positive value. So uh, I'm, I'm all for making more responsibilities on some of these platforms about data, but uh, let's not kill uh, open data. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to, to confuse open data with community-owned data, because I wasn't suggesting that the co-ops would make it open, quite the opposite. I was suggesting that they demand services in return for providing the data-driven insights that would enable the services. Now, I'm also a fan of open data, and I think, as you're absolutely right, it benefits all parties particularly startups and innovation. And, and I think that you know, we should encourage that. And in fact, what's interesting is that um, new technologies like uh, uh, what's called, uh, well, the federated learning, but also what's called um, confidential computing allows you to derive insights across data that you don't own and can't see. So you don't actually need to make it open anymore to develop the vaccines, which is a really interesting thing. You have to have people willing to participate in a consortium, which is perhaps a knit, but it's a financially really important knit. Yeah, I have to really agree with, um, well, both Pam and Sandy, but really on that last point in terms of, one, we don't have to now open up data and, and get to all of the kind of concerns that that may have um, to get, allow various organizations to gain insights from that data. And in fact, having an intermediary likely isn't going to cut off access from data because if people want to share their data, it is actually quite difficult now in many ways for an individual or even a community to figure out a way to share their data. An intermediary institution is useful in that sense. And if people aren't interested in monetizing their data, that's wonderful, then they should just share it. I, I think this is very much and I want to clarify this because I think it's a really important point. It's not a play to say, let's commodify more and more data. It's a play to say some data is already a commodity and it's an incredibly dysfunctional commodity that's not treating people well. And so let's bring that back into these organizations that can be accountable um, to make sure that that space is not so dysfunctional and is not, uh, you know, not working for companies, not working for individuals, not working for communities. And really one of the best ways to do that is to start with existing institutions that have that trust, as Cindy has pointed out several times. Um, but there are also ways to do that that involve digitally native organizations because we are now probably a part of digitally native communities that we trust in that way as well. And you know, many people are, and I know I am. And so I think that combination of approaches can give us some of the power of open data and is absolutely not about shutting down data sharing that currently exists or about commodifying data sharing that doesn't need to be commodified, but about enabling these exchanges in ways that are much more equitable and functional than what we see now. Right, thank you, Divya. Yeah, I, you know, maybe I'll make one comment before I ask my next question, which is um, uh, you know, with Pam's comments about you know, the data that we needed to share in order to develop the vaccine. Uh, you know, if you're someone who has used 23andMe, for example, or in my case, researched uh, that platform, 
that I think is kind of an illustrative of this conundrum we're in, where you have the opportunity to share data, share genetic data specifically uh, with research institutions, including Stanford, last time I checked, who are you know doing the type of kind of public research that we all potentially want to support for those types of measures. But you're also sharing it with Procter and Gamble and pharmaceutical companies, and you're not given a choice on that platform. It's basically all or nothing. You share, you don't share, and of course you can withdraw, but you know you can't make those decisions. And so as you know, to me, it's kind of the conundrum of that self-dealing intermediary here. It's where, where we basically just have to trust 23andMe in the tips of research they're they're proliferating, but also we know that you know they are personally profiting from it in a way that we don't have much say in. Um, Pam, I want to yeah, ask and you also, a question. You know, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Divya. And Jen, I know you've done tons of research on this, but um, even things like genomic data, which seems so personal, if I and my parents go ahead and get our gene sequence for 23andMe, and I choose to share this data, and I have a brother who's incredibly privacy focused, who would never agree to that. Well, you know, too bad for him because 23andMe now has a huge amount of his information too. So I think even these kinds of data that are in intensely personal, there are still collective claims on that data and, and ways that we need to safeguard those claims. Like we we just don't have a way to do that now. And I think even if even if data co-ops aren't the right approach, you think there has to be a way to do that. And, and to me, that brings us back to this collective stewardship question. Thank you. Um, Pam, I would like to ask you to kind of address what I always think of as kind of the 800 gorilla or 800 pound gorilla, sorry, <laughs> uh, in the room when we talk about these data governance issues, which is that uh, from the consumer perspective, many people think about this in terms of data ownership. And this is the message that resonates, you know, very popularly. Uh, you know, one of yesterday's panelists at this conference, Andrew Yang, has built an entire um, advocacy group focused on owning your data. Um, and I would really just appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to um, basically debunk um, that position or tell us um, why it is not kind of optimal in this space to claim ownership and why, you know, if whatever form we might take here, it's probably a, a form of a licensing regime, which I just think is much harder to sell to consumers and to explain to the public. So that's a really good question. Um, so uh, one thing to know uh, is that as a matter of intellectual property law, nobody can own data, okay? Um, data, in fact, is uh, considered public domain uh, as a matter of copyright law. Uh, you can't patent data. Uh, you can't. You can trademark it, but only uh, that only applies to uh, something that's acts as a trademark. Um, uh, the regime that uh, that uh, data privacy most uh, resembles is actually trade secrecy law, and. Um, uh, uh, one of the reasons why we create exclusive rights like copyrights and patents is because we want transactions to happen. We want people to be able to sell to this person sells to that person who sells to that person who sells to that person. Um, and we want that flow to happen without constraints. Uh, now, one of the things about trade secrecy law, uh, which I think has an interesting parallel to uh, to um, uh, to data privacy, um, is that when I give somebody trade secret information, I give it to them for a particular purpose. And if they use it beyond that purpose, or if they transfer it without getting permission from me, uh, then they have engaged in misappropriation and I can sue them for, uh, for damages and get an injunction. Uh, and it seems to me that, that there's a closer parallel with data privacy, right? You give your data to 23andMe, you gave it for a particular purpose. You didn't intend for them to do X, Y, and Z with that uh, with that data. Uh, and so, one of the things that the European Union does uh, in, re in regulating uh, data uh, is basically to say you give it for a particular purpose. If they want to use it for a different purpose, then they've got to get um, a separate permission. And that seems to me, you give it in confidence, right? There's a kind of confidential relationship. Um, that's why I think that kind of information fiduciary idea is, uh, is a powerful one, um, uh, that when you give it over, when you allow them to collect, um, then they have some responsibility. Um, and that's uh, that, that conceptualization is a good one. So when people talk about, uh, as the Data Freedom uh, Act uh, does, about you know transferring exclusive rights in your data, you, the only way that you have any kind of rights in your data um, is because you have some possession of them. 
there's no intellectual property right. And in fact, it'd probably be unconstitutional to uh, enact legislation to give people property rights in their, in their data. So, um, uh, so there's that. But a licensing regime can work whether or not somebody actually has, um, uh, right, has, um, has intellectual property rights in something. So um, if I have a database, uh, as uh, uh, Lexis and Westlaw do, of public domain legal uh, uh, legal opinions, judicial opinions, and statutes, I can charge people money. I can license the use of that uh, of that uh, because I possess this thing, and uh, the sort of the possession of your data is something that you may have. Um, uh, certainly, your ability to aggregate a whole bunch of information about yourself, but there's no such thing as ownership of data. I just yeah. want to clarify too that the Data Freedom Act doesn't take a data direct ownership approach. Actually, it talks about exclusive rights. Okay, um, it does. Um, yeah. So, so the, I think we really see it, it as, a, that as a should take it out. Process. So the thing that that worked well at Davos was to say no, you don't get to have ownership, but you get to have some ownership rights. You get to have for and right. what it's actually implying is a licensing regime. That you have a copy, exactly. your right uh, rights to have a copy of the data. That you get to have some say in the disposition of the data, which means that there was a license given, and the focus was more than on um, having informed consent about what was done with data that you shared, or data that you uh, provided, and the informed consent is often twisted and very sort of uh, unfortunately legalistic ways. But you know, the, the sort of rule of thumb of if you ask somebody, is this something you intended and they're surprised, then you didn't have informed consent is, is the way I find that it helps people understand. This is that you have to understand what's happening to your data. Uh, and it, it really is a licensing regime. Um, but you can refer back to, uh, I'm told, I'm not a lawyer myself, but uh, you can refer back to the old sort of common law notion of data rights, which are the basis for being able to license. So, ownership so, let, let, so that you can license. Luckily, we have one of the best on the panel with us. Um, yes, but, I know, I know. So, <laughs> so to talk um, about I'm keeping stuff, an eye yeah. on the time, and I believe we're going to be opening this up to audience questions in about five more minutes. Um, but what I, I'd like to ask you, Sandy, um, just in general, you know, shifting towards a data commons approach or however we actually end up implementing something like this uh, is going to be reliant on building some amount of new te technical infrastructure or rethinking how we currently exchange data today. Um, and I'm curious, you know, can you give us an idea of what you think some of the most important changes that we may need in order to shift to a approach where, for example, we can track the provenance and data, which I think is a really yeah. important piece of- So, so first of all, of let me puzzles. just object to a data commons approach because that's, uh, I think, confusing with open data, right? So open data is great, but that's not what I'm at least talking about. I'm talking about, um, people being able to have possession of their data in a fiduciary sense, an organization, helping them represent, represent them to be able to do things. And, and so what that is doing is that's a regime for having your local representative, your fiduciary representative, help you with what you should share for what sort of return, helping you understand all the complexities of it, and acting for you once you've given your assent. Um, so what that does is, of course, is create a much more liquid data market, which benefits all sorts of processes, right? Including startups and things like that. But it's not necessarily a commons, right? It's something where there's much more diverse control. So it's like Piketty says, is you know, it's, it's not that high returns to capital are bad, it's, that it's in too few hands. So it's not like returns to data are bad. You want to have the data in lots of hands. Um, so it's, it's enabling that. And the technology that is key to that are, are things like federated learning, where you do not share the data, 
What you do is you share insights about the data, statistics about the data. And this is immensely practical now. For instance, you know, on Android phones, a thing called swipe, which is how you type, right, is they don't share what you type to uh, improve the AI there. They share some statistics about where it got went wrong. They encrypt that. They send it back to headquarters. Uh, but you can't see what you typed. You never shared your data. You share some statistics. But what they send back is the key to improving your own phone. Similarly, mobile advertising. Google tried to do this. They rolled it out, this federated approach out, to 2 billion users without anybody noticing. Because it works just as well as the centralized approach, but doesn't share data. Now, it has other difficulties because there's enough cheating going on in the data ecosystem that it didn't fix everything. But that's, that's a sort of side note. So the point is, is, is you can now have uh, alliances where you're sharing statistics about data, not things that are traceable to individuals and still get performance of AI algorithms that are equivalent to actually having possession of the data. And that's amazing because you no longer have to hold and own the data. You have to have permission from the data holder to be able to see statistics about the data that you hold. And of course, you get to choose that because you now still have control of the data in this sort of privacy, uh, 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 copyright sort of way. You haven't given away the data. And so there really is uh, uh, the technology for making these very liquid data markets where you're sharing insights rather than the data itself. And the performance of those markets is likely to be virtually equivalent to today's regime where you're sending copies of data everywhere. And of course it gets stolen. Because there's copies everywhere. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at some of the questions that have come in. And one of the first off the top is just, um, and Pam, I think maybe you could take this. Uh, it's just a quick clarification on um, Section 230 and the fiduciary, the information fiduciary proposal that you mentioned. Can you take a moment to just explain that in a little bit more detail? Sure. Um, so I refer you to uh, an article that uh, Jack Balkin uh, of Yale Law School uh, published in the Harvard Law Review, um, uh, I think in 2020. Uh, and uh, he develops the idea of the information uh, fiduciary having a duty of care, having a duty of confidentiality, and a duty of loyalty. Uh, and he spells that out in more detail than I can do um, uh, at this time. Uh, but it, it has this notion that, uh, that you have this kind of trust relationship um, with uh, the data about, uh, about people. Um, and, um, you know, one of the questions that I posed to Divya is, where's the leverage come from uh, to get somebody to take on uh, this information fiduciary responsibility? And um, Section 230 of the, uh, what's often called the Communications Decency Act, um, uh, says that uh, platforms, social media companies and other uh, interactive computer services um, uh, are not to be treated as the publisher or speaker of information provided by, uh, by third parties, by other people, uh, so that if they, are, um, if they are a platform and they have a lot of user-generated content, um, if somebody says something defamatory, um, then uh, the platform can't get sued, even if the platform uh, knows about it because it didn't supply the information. So one of those things that these interactive services want to be able to do is to be able to get rid of lawsuits um, uh, that uh, would challenge something uh, that they didn't take down certain information um, uh, when uh, that information was uh, unlawful uh, and uh, harm somebody. And Section 230 basically means that you can get out on a motion to dismiss. Um, and so it's a very, very valuable 
uh, safe harbor from liability that uh, that these interactive computer services uh, really want to uh, uh, continue to enjoy. Uh, and so one of the things you could do is you could uh, amend Section 230 so that that particular immunity is available to uh, entities that have agreed to become information fiduciaries. Thank you. Uh, it's been, and an, the information fiduciary idea has definitely been picked up from the privacy community in particular. And, um, you know, one of my concerns is simply that, you know, at this point, the Googles and the Facebooks uh, of this world, <laughs> um, I'm not sure we can necessarily even try, trust them with uh, kind of fiduciary duties and the data they hold. But it, it speaks to a, another question that came up um, in the chat that I think kind of underlies all of these different discussions, which is the specific question was who audits the data cooperatives? Um, and I think that holds true just in terms of thinking of things like fiduciary duties, but also just in terms of who, who ensures that the data was collected with consent and how do we manage that? It, it just seems like there's a lot of data infrastructure here that leans on a, um, for one thing, probably a presumption that we have civil society, public sector resources to put to this, whether it is a retooled FTC, whether it is a new agency that oversees data, we're just talking about the US, um, and who, who are the people who actually you know, do the auditing work uh, this is something that comes up often in discussions of AI. Who audits the algorithms? Like, who has that specialty? Do you does it need a PhD in AI in order to audit? Uh, so I want to throw that back to the three of you, Divya. I'll, I'll start with you. Um, just to, you know, have in your work on this proposal, was there much thought given to kind of you know who who performs this magic in the background? If you want to think of it that. Way? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I saw Sandy uh, speak, so I'll try to be brief. Um, a couple of things. One, what an amazing intro to uh, Deb's talk on algorithmic auditing next. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that much of this will be answered uh, from that perspective there. So would direct you to that. Uh, two, you know, I think our proposal comes up with something called the Data Relations Board um, that is modeled on the Labor Relations Board that does some of this auditing mechanisms. Um, I think in terms of saying, and Pam also brought this up, right? Like where do the resources for all of this come from? How do we make this work? Where's the leverage? Uh, I think there is actually a huge amount of investment in figuring out data policy already. So it's not the case that it's something that we have to convince national, international governments is, is important. There are huge initiatives at the international and the national levels to look at this. And so I think redirecting some of that into some of this audit capability is, is very possible and building the technical architecture for it is already being done for things like algorithmic audits, audits but also the kind of work that was mentioning in terms of figuring out compliance for regulation and things like this. But Sandy, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so um, I act as advisor to the OECD on these sorts of issues. And it, you know, the thing to realize is that um, data is already audited in at least a certain sense. Because whenever you sell a company, um, an enormous amount of the value is the data. So for instance, when MGM was sold, 60% or more of the, the value was data. That's amazing, right? So how do you know that that's valid? How do you know that there's ownership rights? And so the, the proposal by people like the OECD are that um, the current uh, financial auditing, so the big four and so forth, also have to extend that auditing to include data because data is a large part of the value of these companies. And a lot of that would be establishing do you have the rights to use this data or not, right? Do you have data which is not being used, which means it's a liability, uh, or, uh, and are you behaving correctly with respect to the licenses that, the, uh, uh, that you've been given to use the data? So there's actually a lot of sort of movement in this direction already, and it's not civil society. Right? I mean, it's not uh, government, it's civil society. It's things like the big four uh, auditing. And, and of course, that would start with things that are already heavily regulated and audited, which is why starting with financial institutions or similar types of things is a really good place because they already have to be subject to this sort of scrutiny. There's agencies, there's traditions. And so you're just expanding them to this new sort of value uh, that previously was ignored on their books 
but yet is valued in their stock price and, and other sorts of, of things. So I think that's probably the way to do it. One of, the, one of the major things, though, is that you have to be able to audit the use of data. Right? And so currently, when you create these data pools, it becomes really difficult to tell what's been done with the data. And one of the things I like about federated learning and these sort of networks of sharing data insights is now it becomes really easy to tell what questions have been asked of what data, by who, and did they have the correct permissions. And in the case of AI uh, or algorithms like that, you can ask, is this a fair algorithm? Is this doing what it's legally required to? So for instance, recently we spun up a facility for the Inter-American Development Bank that audits all of the data use and algorithms in the social um, programs of Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil. Right? Because you record what were the data in, what were the decisions that went out, and you compare that to um, gold standards, uh, which are visiting people, talking to them, which they do anyhow. Uh, and you can begin to, and we found very quickly, that many of their social support algorithms were extremely biased. They missed people they shouldn't have. They had other sorts of problems. But because they were audited, you could begin fixing these things. So it was an immediate sort of thing. So in this case, it was the, the Inter-American Development Bank um, forcing governments to audit their own algorithms, their own algorithms to be able to enforce fairness, which uh, you know the Inter-American Development Bank has an interest in. So another question uh, that was raised here is um, around incentives. And so, um, Divi, I'd like to pose this to you, and it might be one of the last ones we get to, uh, which is just the question of, um, you know, what are the incentives of data cooperatives, and you know, how do we oversee them? And so, I guess a kind of alternative thought here is, um, you know, what what would make this a more attractive model than simply uh, posing fiduciary duties on top of the existing actors that we see today? Um, so I guess if you could speak to both, like what would be the incentives to create these different cooperatives? Um, and I guess what advantage would that give us over simply potentially just using fiduciary duties to kind of make the current set of data players more responsible for their individual's data? Yeah, I think that's a great question and a, a good ending. So I, I think to take your second point first about what, uh, why not just impose these fiduciary duties? Well, one, I think the, the Section 230 companies, right, the ones that are beholden to that are a small portion of the companies that use a huge amount of data today. And so while I think it's really useful to think about points of leverage and Section 230 is one such point of leverage, that doesn't apply to most entities that currently process and, and use data. Um, and I think broadly fiduciary duties, while are, are built into data cooperatives, are not necessarily enough to, you know, uh, represent the financial and control rights that people have to data in addition to, to privacy. Um, and I think in terms of the incentives of data cooperatives, ideally those incentives, I mean, the incentives should be aligned with those of the members, right? And we have a couple of uh, provisions in the, the Data Freedom Act and other scholars have proposed other provisions um, like Katrina Leggett, who spoke earlier, uh, in terms of how to make those alignments possible. I think some of it is around data cooperatives themselves being funded from either donations, if it's a it's a thing that preserves privacy, or through public sector funding, or civil society funding, or through the monetization of data, and so tying those incentives together in that sense. I think it's also the case that we need incentives that are aligned across the ecosystem, which is a, an issue now. And while there is some level of policy that's necessary, some of that incentive has to come from the recognition that, look, the technology we're able to build from this type of process involving so much more high quality data, involving different sorts of insights, involving you know, possibly the data that contains some of the solutions to the problems that we're struggling with is such, is such has such huge potential that we can align the incentives of a bunch of organizations in the space to collecting and preserving and protecting that data and making trust in that ecosystem work down to the data cooperative, down to the individual in the community. So I think it's, it's really about making sure that all of those different incentives move towards what, what we all want, right? Which is an ecosystem of 
collective intelligence, maybe it's community intelligence, um, you know, this, this space of technological progress that's really equitably distributed, that recognizes the input of humans to all of the systems that, that we uh, live under, which means the decision-making capacity and participation of people as well. Um, and, and that creates this kind of progress in a shared sense. Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, I'm gonna squeeze in one more quick thought on that, uh, just building on what you said, um, based on one more question that is in here, which is um, how do data cooperatives account for the diversity within the communities they serve? And I think that's an important piece that I would like to get you to just give us one last comment on before we, we wrap up. Yeah, I think this actually speaks to something Jen, you and I talked about earlier. You know, what does this mean for marginalized communities? Is this going to entrench existing inequalities? Um, Pam brought up what I think is a really important question, uh, which is we don't want to commodify uh, all data, right? We're, we're not trying to commodify data that shouldn't be commodified, and that's a delicate balance. Um, and I think it's really great that we have people like Pam pushing on those questions, because right now a ton of data is being commodified that maybe we don't want to be commodified, and we're moving things into that commodity space day by day, data cooperatives or not, and we want to push against that, right? And so I think my answer to this kind of speaks to some of what Sandy said too. We've seen time and time again that marginalized communities can build power through collective action, Labor unions were so much the site of this in the earlier wave of shared prosperity in the US and around the world in the last century. Um, and sometimes these participatory and democratic processes are the ways to referee those value disagreements, to bring up you know, minority concerns. And uh, data collaboratives can offer an approach to build this kind of power in collective action for different communities coming together in the digital age. So I think, you know, will data co-ops solve the deep inequalities that exist in our society today? not by themselves certainly but they can i think mitigate and bring up the power of uh those who are currently most marginalized through these collective action kinds of uh agreements and kinds of processes that are what have brought back uh power imbalances in the past and and historically have been crucial to correcting those those issues great i think we'll hold it there thank you so much all three of you this has been a great conversation at least i think it has uh, I really appreciate it. And thanks to Eric and Dan for giving us all the platform today. Great. Thank yeah. you. For leading us. <laughs> well, well, thank you all. Uh, thanks, Jen, Divya, Pamela, Sandy. Uh, many thanks for that really wonderful discussion. Uh, you all have such deep knowledge of this topic, and it was great to see it on display. And the way you interacted with the panel was, was really terrific. Um, we'll have our next panel shortly, which will discuss algorithmic bias, auditing, and accountability. Uh, but first, we're going to take a brief break. Um, we're going to resume at 11, 10 Pacific time. So in about 10 minutes, we'll see you then. Thanks.
Welcome back. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our final proposal of the conference and welcome Professor Fiona Scott Morton, who is going to moderate this session. Fiona is the Theodore Nienberg Professor of Economics at Yale University School of Management. She's a research associate at the NBER and she has degrees from Yale and MIT. She served as the chief economist of the antitrust division of the US Department of Justice under President Obama and is currently helping to run a digital platform initiative at Yale University. Fiona, welcome. Thanks so much, Eric. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I uh, hope all of you uh, out there watching are going to enjoy this final panel. I'm really pleased to welcome our proposer, Deborah Raji. Deb is a computer scientist and an activist who focuses on algorithmic bias, auditing, and accountability. She's a fellow at the Mozilla Foundation, uh, researching algorith algorithmic evaluation, and also at the Algorithmic Justice League. Uh, where she researches gender and racial bias in facial recognition technology. She has also worked with Google's ethical AI team and been a research fellow at the Partnership on AI and AI Now Institute at New York University, where she studied how to operationalize ethical considerations in machine learning engineering practice. She's now a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. Today, Deb will discuss AI accountability and how to create a pathway for third-party auditors to ensure that AI doesn't cause harm to society. This is obviously a fantastic topic and we're really looking forward to hearing from Deb. Uh, Deb, welcome and please share your screen when you're ready. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, let's see, let's spend a second. Okay. Good. Um, all right, we're good. All right. So hi, um, I'm Deb. Sorry, one second. Uh, and I'm here to talk about a proposal for algorithmic accountability, uh, fostering an AI ecosystem for uh, third party participation. Um, sorry, one second. There's something on my screen. Let me just adjust that really quickly. Um, before I continue. Um, and I want to start the conversation with really spotlighting who um, uh, you know third party auditors are most concerned about and just the perspective coming from that angle. Um, so this is Josea Elston Burrell. He is one of many students impacted by the algorithm that was deployed by the UK government um, uh, to address the fact that students can sit for their final A-level exam. So they used an algorithm to adjust their final grades. Um, and in the case of Josea, that adjusted his grade in his Mandarin course from an A to a C, thus jeopardizing his ability to enter university that year. Um, this is Tammy Dobbs and she yep. is- uh, Sorry sorry to interrupt. I don't think we're seeing your slides advance. Oh, uh, uh, you're not seeing the slides at all? Slide. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's showing the, the first slide, slide still. Oh. Okay, should I reshare? Uh, should I reshare the slides? Let's yes, try let's, let's try resharing that. Okay, let me stop sharing and share again. Uh, it might be Deb that seeing the list down the edge, the left-hand edge is necessary to see the advancing. Do you have two screens in front of you? No, I have one screen. I'm on a, a single laptop. Can you see this is the second slide? No. First oh, slide. no. Okay. Um, this is interesting. Maybe go back before you do slideshow, go back to the where we can see the uh, whole screen. Now try. Uh, I should try play? No, no, no. Now move to the next slide. Yeah. Oh, okay. So uh -oh. I can't. Um, I won't be able to, when I do this, um, like you didn't see the change in the slide happening right now. Correct, I'm looking at Josiah Elliston Burrell. Oh, okay, um, that's unfortunate. Um, I guess one option is I could also um, export to a PDF and play it immediately. <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties. Well, if, if you don't have animations, I think you could just click through this way. Yeah. Do you have animations? Oh, I don't have animations. I guess- I think if you just click through this way, that, that works fine. Okay, let's, let's, let's do that. Okay, let's do that. Okay, um, so this is Tammy Dobbs and she experienced a similar sort of uh, 
form of algorithmic harm where because of an algorithm she lives she's a disabled woman that lives in Arkansas and in need of nurse care under Medicaid and the allowed allotted amount of uh, nurse care hours were cut in half for her because of an algorithmic glitch. And this is Robert Williams, who was wrongfully arrested because of a false facial recognition match. So we actually have a lot of these situations where you have these algorithmic deployments impacting you know, many, many people and the actual individual harm experienced is, is very serious consequences. So um, you know, this is an older case from 2016, uh, Michigan tried to develop um, the Midas unemployment algorithm to sort of just flag cases of unemployment fraud applications. And in at least 20,000 cases, wrongfully accused individuals of unemployment fraud. One of those individuals was Brian Russell, who um, due to that false accusation had to file for bankruptcy and was only cleared by the state of the false charges two years later. Uh, we also see a, a similar sort of pattern in tenant screening algorithms that are notorious for um, being unbelievably inaccurate. So Devon Jackson um, was falsely flagged by an algorithm as uh, having an arrest record and thus denied for home, a low income housing in Tennessee. And as a result was forced to live in a small motel room with his nine-year-old daughter for nearly a year. Uh, we see a similar thing with you know, the Stanford infamous uh, Stanford vaccination rollout plan and algorithm, uh, which allocated only seven of 5,000 available doses to frontline health staff. Um, and Nuriel, who was very vocal about this issue online, um, uh, declared that he had to go to another hospital to get vaccination in order to protect himself, his family, and his patients. So these headlines are becoming more and more common where we see these algorithms failing and failing in particular for certain underrepresented groups. Um, and these headlines just keep continuing and the damage being done is becoming increasingly clear. I think sometimes when people uh, think about AI, uh, broadly speaking, or, you know, they, it's, it's similar to the way that they talk about robotics. Um, so, you know, in robotics, a lot of people uh, the public thinks a lot about, you know, uh, Sophia the robot type robots that are very humanoid, bipedal robots, you know, very complicated looking and very impressive looking. Um, when in reality, you know, the, 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 the real way that robotics has influenced their lives so far has been through something like a Roomba deployed in about a million homes. The Roomba is the most widely deployed robot um, in the country right now. Um, and it's a much simpler device, a much less complicated looking device, um, but it impacts their personal lives in very small ways. So in AI, you know, although the, the, we, we like to talk about this vision of AI uh, uh, and the sort of, sort of complex sci-fi reality of what we think the technology can do, the reality is that we're dealing with a lot of these uh, Roomba algorithms. They're very simple um, and they impact lives in very sort of uh, pernicious and, and difficult to detect small ways, but they're quite impactful as a result of that fact and the fact that they impact so many people and they're so widespread. And unfortunately, what we're seeing as with any built artifact, uh, you know, you end up with accidents, you end up with um, these car crash of car crash situations where uh, these systems fail, and uh, in particular with algorithms, we're seeing them fail disproportionately for a particular segment of the population. And once you have a system, uh, you know, crashing or failing for a segment of the population, there needs to be this question of accountability. You know, is there something about the way that this artifact was built that caused this failure? You know, and as a result, who is responsible for making changes or making or the decision making that contributed to this outcome? So this is where external third party audits become an interesting um, mechanism for algorithmic accountability to consider. So to describe just what external, what I mean by external third party audits, um, these are the sort of types of algorithmic auditors that have no contractual relationship to the audit target. So um, an internal auditor might be sort of uh, uh, an internal responsible innovation team um, at uh, let's say uh, a tech company, so Microsoft or Google, or it might be a contracted uh, consultant, so Accenture or Orca, um, and they have direct access to the system. They're looking at the system pre-deployment, and they're often very concerned about compliance to external regulation or quality control, interests that align with the corporate interests. Whereas external auditors are uh, regulators like the FDA or NIST, um, the markup or other investigative journalism groups like ProPublica, um, civil society groups like AJL or ACLU or law firms. 
And what they're interested in is uh, their representatives and, the and, the, and protecting the interests of their representatives and collecting evidence uh, for concerns related to their representative groups. Um, and these third party auditors are looking at the system post deployment, often dealing with complaints after the system's already been released out there. And they're not given access to the system typically. So they only have consumer level or indirect access to the system. An example of what an internal audit might look like is the Smactor framework used in Google, um, where it's an independent team within the organization at Google sort of assessing how different decisions throughout the engineering development process align with Google's high level principles um, or Google's obligations in terms of liability. And that differs a lot from uh, an audit like Gender Shades, for example. So Gender Shades was an external audit done by Joy Blanwini and Timnit Gebru. And what it was looking at was the performance of commercial facial recognition tools on uh, different demographic subgroups. And what they found was that a lot of these deployed systems failed disproportionately for the darker female subgroup. Um, and you know they had no contractual relationship with any of those organizations. So they, they kind of constitute and play that role of external auditor. So when we think about the different components of an audit, an audit can really be um, summarized as having two components. One really looking at the evaluation and the assessment of the tool and the other more focused on accountability. So gender shades, looking again at gender shades, what are the sort of design components of gender shades? So gender shades, one of the sort of key contributions of that paper was the fact that in comparison to all the other mainstream facial recognition data sets at the time, uh, the PPB benchmark used in gender shades was much more balanced with respect to representation for male and female and darker and lighter subjects. And as a result, they were able to sort of assess performance on these intersectional subgroups. And you know, following gender shades, there has been other external audits done by the ACLU, um, Big Brother Watch UK, which is a, a civil society group in, in the UK, um, and, and the National Institute of Standards and Technology sort of doing other evaluations of the same types of systems and asking similar questions of those systems. So the evaluation component is super critical to what defines an audit. And you know, beyond the facial recognition space, uh, you know, we have other really great examples of these very creative evaluations to really assess and provide evidence for particular concerns expressed by a certain community. So here you have, uh, you know, the markup has done multiple great audits looking at, you know, the percentage of search results coming from a particular source um, uh, from Google search engines. And then here's the audit for um, the A-level algorithms. So there's all these evaluations that occur in order to be able to ask questions about how well these systems are actually working and who they're actually working for. And this evaluation component of the audit sort of complements the second part where it's not just about getting to a sort of description of you know, who the system is failing for and how it's failing, but also thinking about uh, accountability and how to translate that evaluation into an actual accountability outcome. So in the case of gender shades, because of the audit result, they were able to get a corporate response. There were other design decisions made that made the, the, the sort of project very visible in a way that garnered a, a corporate response. So they named multiple targets and, and as a result of that, it kind of uh, launched the, the, the study into the press in a way that garnered uh, uh, reactions from all the different companies that were audited, the, specifically the audit targets. And uh, within seven months of the release of the study, all the audit targets had updated their system. So Microsoft, uh, and you can see specifically that they improve, they uh, updated performance specifically on the darker female subgroup. So if you look at Microsoft, um, Face++, Plus Plus, and IBM, um, the year after they were audited by Gender Shades, they had made updates to their product. So Gender Shades led to sort of a lot of public outcry and product updates, um, but there's also a lot of nationwide regulatory changes on facial recognition that were inspired by this, um, this particular audit. Um, in addition to that, um, the audits that it inspired, led by NIST and ACLU, uh, all led to this volunteer recall where a lot of the companies that were audited by gender, sh gender shades in the subsequent studies, so uh, this is Amazon, IBM, and Microsoft in particular, um, stated that they would have these, um, they, they would sort of uh, engage in a voluntary moratorium of the sale of their facial recognition technology to police. Um, and then similarly, other external audits, uh, such as that of, markup, of the markup, um, has led to congressional hearings. And then Foxglove's audit of the A-level um, algorithm actually led to the 
uh, the recall of the use of that algorithm that particular year um, after they filed several lawsuits. So um, all this to say external audits are a very effective mechanism to hold stakeholders accountable when they release or um, de design or uh, develop algorithms that are, are negatively impacting the lives of real people. So again, sort of who is conducting these audits, the range of third party auditors is, is pretty vast. So you have academics, civil society, journalists, law firms, regulators. Um, and here's just a couple names of specifically who I'm talking about. Um, but all of these sort of fall under the range of people participating in this third party audit work at this moment right now, trying to hold these tech companies accountable for the algorithms that they develop and release into the world. Um, uh, and in addition to different um, institutions accountable for how they make use of these algorithms. So, you know, what is difficult about being an auditor? What are the specific challenges? What makes it really hard to play this third party audit role? If it's such an effective mechanism for algorithmic accountability, why don't more people do it? So one issue is that of access, um, you know, after, um, we had audited um, uh, Kairos, which is a facial recognition startup, uh, they immediately put up this paywall. And not only did they put up the paywall, but because um, uh, they, they used to have a freemium, a freemium sort of tier. But after they had put up the paywall, if we wanted to be able to um, access their system in order to be able to audit it, they actually had a whole terms of service uh, clause in there that was sort of um, you know, uh, dissuading or discouraging the use of the, the, the API for the sake of audit activity. Um, so that kind of reaction to the potential of being audited um, is pretty common in the tech space now. Uh, in fact, uh, Julia Angwin from the markup uh, recently led this campaign with the markup on um, uh, you know, scraping is not a crime where a, a lot of the times third party auditors, because they're not given direct access to the system, will have to, you know, uh, scrape different platforms or think creatively about how to crowdsource information um, and thus be sort of vulnerable to retaliation by these tech companies that do not want to be inspected, that do not want to have their algorithms inspected. Um, and they'll leverage everything from anti-hacking laws to anti-private to, to privacy laws um, to try to sort of uh, discourage or actively dissuade these, these um, third party auditors from, from collecting the information that they need to do their evaluations. Um, so here you can see, um, you know, uh, uh, Julia Angwin sort of advocating uh, for uh, uh, updates to the anti-hacking law CFAA in order to protect uh, data journalists and those doing this sort of external accountability work. Um, and we've seen Facebook recently go after uh, an external audit team at NYU that was attempting to audit the newsfeed for political ad targeting. Uh, they also went after uh, Algorithm Watch that was looking at um, the Instagram algorithm. Um, and similarly, uh, Clearview AI uh, challenged uh, a lot of watchdogs that were uh, attempting to uh, uh, scrutinize their systems. So you can see again, uh, this sort of repeated opportunity that companies have to really attack companies um, uh, using leveraging sort of um, anti-hacking and, and, and privacy laws. So, um, we, but we have had some wins. So here's uh, Sandvig and Barr, which was sort of a critical case in uh, federal court where they said that, uh, you know, big data discrimination studies could be exempt from federal anti-hacking laws. Um, however, you know, this ruling uh, does not, is not necessarily law. And thus um, those that engage in this third party work are still really vulnerable uh, to these uh, legal attacks. So aside from access, you know, what are the other, issues or the other challenges involved in third-party auditing. Um, so one is harms discovery. Um, so harms discovery is really this challenge of the fact that it can be really difficult to identify a target and to know what to audit for, um, either in terms of like which vendor, which company to audit for, or um, exactly, uh, you know, uh, identifying the algorithms uh, within a broader ecosystem of something that might be impacting someone. So for example, if, renter, if a renter gets denied rent, 
uh, understanding how the algorithm factors into that result is very difficult and, and very tricky to detect from the outside. Um, uh, but even if you do somehow find out that you're, uh, you know, that an algorithm is part of the process that, neg that negatively impacted you, who do you contact and how do you contact them? Um, so that's always been a challenge in terms of third party accountability work. A lot of the way in which we find things out is very ad hoc. Um, so for example, with Robert Williams, he overheard a police officer talking about facial recognition, had recently read about um, you know, the racial discrepancy in performance for those systems and was able to make that match and communicate that. But very rarely does that happen. And then the sort of final challenge is that of audit impact. So after you have um, executed the audit uh, and you want to sort of, uh, you know, understand how it intersects with sort of a broader process of accountability, it's really important to reflect on how to actually get the audit results to result in the impact that you want to see. So Gender Shades was very effective in terms of uh, getting to product updates for the three companies that were uh, called out explicitly in that audit, but other companies like Amazon and Kairos, which were not explicitly audited, but were selling the same product in the same industry, um, still had large discrepancies between the darker female and lighter male subgroup. And we can see this repeated in follow-up studies as well, where uh, you can only really target a specific demographic group, prediction task, or company. Um, it's very, very difficult um, uh, to uh, get the audit to be visible to every single actor that you want to influence. You have very little control over the audit target response as well. So a company can react however way they see fit. There's no sort of mandate on how exactly they're gonna react um, and um, uh, if they're going to react to the magnitude that you need them to. So it's very little control over exactly what the audit target response is gonna be. And that makes it very challenging to translate the evaluation to accountability. So these are the three challenges and uh, the three solutions that we're sort of hoping to bring forward are uh, around this idea of an audit oversight board, a national incident reporting system, and a post audit and post audit interventions. So the auditor oversight board is this idea of in order to provide protected access to accredited third party AI auditors, we can uh, instantiate this audit oversight board. So we already have regulators within federal agencies, you know, FTC, FDA that have inspection powers. Um, for example, the FTC under Article 6B has the ability to be able to demand information from certain um, firms under investigation. FDA similarly can have mandated requests for information, legal immunity if they're attacked for, for access. Um, uh, but these regulators sort of lack the capacity, the expertise, and the level of awareness that other third-party auditors have. So why not extend these powers to other qualified third-party auditors? So the audit board can um, be within one of these agencies or be in its own independent institution, but the idea being that the audit board can mandate access privileges, and it can also me mediate sort of uh, disputes between uh, the auditor and the auditee. The other kind of interesting thing about the audit board is that it can oversee a vetting process to assess independence and qualifications for the auditor. And the kind of analogy for this um, is uh, the Algorithmic Justice League has sort of started this audit, the auditors project, where it's a survey of those that currently identify as algorithmic auditors, and they've done a good job sort of um, indexing uh, the different sort of qualifications that different uh, stakeholders have within this ecosystem. In the medical device space, there's this idea of auditing organizations um, under the medical device single audit program. And these are organizations that are sort of appointed by the health department of a particular government. So this is Health Canada or the FDA. Um, and they will sort of collectively decide on standards um, uh, for practice amongst themselves and, and be able to sort of execute, um, operationally execute on the, the audit work required for medical device surveillance. And then in finance, you have um, SEC's sort of gap principles um, and the international sort of uh, version of that, in addition to uh, an audit standards board from the American Institute of Certified Public, Public Accountants, again, sort of standardizing audit practice and then mediating uh, the access to privileges and to certain um, powers as auditors. So the, the sort of second sol solution or second sort of path forward is this idea of a national incident reporting system. 
So um, the idea of a national incident reporting system is really for the goal of getting logged records of complaints for AI harms discovery. So those that are most aware of these harms have the least capacity to take action on it. Um, we sort of need a, 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 local, a centralized local database to sort of log and organize complaints and known cases of algorithmic harm reported by third parties, including the public. Um, and you know this in the, the the database can't sort of like live by itself. It sort of requires complementary legislation, um, thinking about the disclosure of algorithmic use by federal agencies as an accessible reference for complaints. So if someone um, suspects that they've been impacted by an algorithm, they should have the reference of all the algorithms being used in a particular context. Um, also, there should be some required communication and notice of use during bureaucratic processes involving public agencies. So, for example, if um, uh, you know uh, you were part of a criminal investigation and you suspect that uh, you know, and and um, as part of the criminal investigation, you were you know a risk assessment had been used, you would be sort of notified of the use of that risk assessment so that you would be in a position to be able to file a complaint if you suspected that there was something wrong about the use of that of that tool. Um, so notice of use and disclosure are sort of complementary. Um, policies to this idea of an incident reporting system. Um, and then, of course, uh, this idea of repeat offenders on the, you know, one of the sort of um, benefits of having this logged uh, database is that uh, repeat offenders in the database can be fined and flagged. So if there's a, a company that gets flagged repeatedly or a particular feature or product that gets flagged repeatedly, then that could trigger an investigation and that company could be fined just for being flagged so many times. Um, and these fines can fund you know, bounties or contracts to incentivize third-party auditors to investigate particular uh, repeated uh, issues, re repeated complaints. And uh, there's lots of analogies here. Um, I'm not sure if I have time to go through all of them, but it's pretty much a very common practice. Um, you know, we have in the AI space, a couple of these, the Partnership on AI developed an AI incident database. And there's this tool called Algorithm Tips that is used a lot in investigative journalism. You know, Algorithmic Justice League ourselves, we, we take in, um, we have an intake form and there's a lot of people that contact us through these forms to try to communicate issues that they've experienced in terms of algorithmic, algorithmic, algorithmic harm. Um, and and in the medical device space, you know, the FDA has medical device incident databases and adverse event reporting systems. Um, transportation has, uh, you know, especially the aviation space has a lot of these incident reporting systems. Uh, same with security and finance. And then sort of the final uh, sort of pillar of this of this proposal is this idea of a post audit intervention. So, you know, the first two interventions are really to address the issues of access and harms discovery, which are very tied to how um, well, we do the evaluations of an audit, but the sort of last pillar is this idea of, well, how do you translate those evaluations into accountability outcomes? So we need some post audit interventions to be sort of integrated into the policy agenda. And these are regulatory measures for audit impact or to uh, garner a particular audit response. And that means having these audits feed directly into enforcement, standard setting and reporting. And what this means is direct communication channels between auditors and enforcement agencies, um, you know, auditors setting industry-wide standards for AI development and deployment, and then also some level of public reporting and centralized access to a repository of audit reports. Uh, so the analogies here is that in AI, you know, we had the IEEE P7013 uh, sort of uh, a standard, which was directly developed in response to gender shades. Um, in environmental health and safety audits, uh, there's a lot of uh, direct enforcement and legal reporting powers given to third party auditors that can definitely be ported into the algorithmic space. Um, and then uh, in finance, there's the Edgar database and other resources to figure out which company has been audited by who and facilitate public access to audit reports. So in conclusion, you know, those most likely to be harmed are those the most vulnerable within society and often the least informed and the least involved in AI development and traditionally have been those with the least recourse in terms of um, getting to justice. Um, and when we empower third party auditors, we actually empower these people uh, to be able to challenge, identify and address algorithmic harm impacting their lives. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Deb. Uh, that was great. We will now be joined by our panelists. Uh, DJ Patel is a mathematician and data scientist, a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School, a board member of Devoted Health, and an advisor to Venrock Partners. 
He was also the first US chief data scientist where he helped shape digital policy. Kathy O'Neill is a mathematician, data scientist, and author of the best-selling book, Weapons of Math Destruction, a great title. She also recently founded Orca, an algorithmic auditing company. Uh, welcome, DJ and Kathy. I am going to begin by asking each of you to react to Deb's talk, and I thought I'd start us off with Kathy. Um, why don't I just give you a few minutes to uh, give your reactions. We'll turn it over to DJ, and then we'll have more of a uh, the pre-flow discussion. Well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, first of all, I, I really appreciate Deb's perspective of third-party auditors. And I know she was very active and is very active in this space. And it's an incredibly important, um, it's an incredibly important perspective. Um, I come at it from, um, from a slightly different perspective. And I should I should start by saying I do auditing, but I, I think by Deb's definition, um, some of it's second party in the sense that I get hired by companies to audit their algorithms internally. Um, and then some of it's third party um, because I work with attorney generals in four different states on auditing systems and processes and, and algorithms um, for mostly consumer, consumer products um, in finance. Um, and so I have the perspective of both of those, but I do not have the perspective um, in particular um, from the like sort of journalist markup um, and even the, even the gender shades perspective, which is to say like kind of an adversarial um, audit where you actually have to somehow collect the data yourself. And that's an incredibly important issue. Um, I mean, I guess what I, the reason I chose this field is because I knew that there were algorithms that no journalist, no activist could ever audit that were so internal and so invisible and so inaccessible um, that the only way to actually audit them would be to be to have access to the internal data. So I'm talking about things like uh, how much should someone pay for, you know, pay interest on a, on a loan or how what should the premium be on an insurance product type thing. And to that point, I think what I want to say is that it's very important to me. Uh, I, you know, became an auditor in some sense because I wanted to try to prevent the the field of auditing algorithms, which I I anticipated was going to be inevitable. I wanted to prevent this field from becoming as corrupt as I consider the field is in finance, and in particular the mortgage-backed security um, risk assessments of Moody, Fitch, and S&P um, back in the day in finance when they were giving AAA ratings to mortgage-backed securities, um, they were selling them to the investment banks using models that only the investment banks knew about. Um, and that was, of course, quite corrupt because of the business model itself. And to Deb's point, it would be far better for sec uh, second-party auditors like myself um, to be forced to um, <clears throat> sort of um, publicly describe what are the audits that we're doing, right? I, I would love to insist on that. I would love to have the leverage for that. I do not have the leverage for that. Um, and the reason is, is exactly what Deb said, which is that we don't have enough regulators that are on the ball. We don't have enough lawsuits, plaintiff or class action lawsuits um, to exert pressure to these companies, even the ones that are theoretically, um, uh, you know, uh, under regulation, like insurance or credit or hiring or um, other things. Um, even the ones that are tip, like theoretically regulated, they do not actually have that much pressure to um, make sure their algorithms um, are working well. So I am left as a second party auditor um, trying to understand how their algorithms work in large part to help the regulators uh, make this those standards. So, so long story short, I want what Deb wants, but I will just finish by saying that I think we're not there yet. And I think what the analogy I like to draw is this: it's like you go into a cockpit of an airplane and you see all those dials, and you're like, someone spent a lot of time figuring out what the dials should say and how many dials there should be. And the dials in an airplane are different from the dials in a train, uh, in an engineer the engineering booth in a train 
because when they came up with the technology of, of flight, they were like, there's different risks and there's different things we have to keep track of. And there's different monitoring systems. There's a different dashboard of metrics that we had to make sure were okay in order for this flight to be safe. And what we're doing now, um, what we're in the stage of now is designing the cockpit of, of, the, of the airplanes. And the airplanes here are the AI systems that are high stakes. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is like, we, I'd love to have a standard algorithm algorithmic audit for, for something like an insurance product, but we haven't actually figured out what, what that looks like. We haven't, we don't know what the dials are. We don't know what the monitors are. We don't know what the standard audit should be yet. Um, and that is a lot of work that we're gonna have to do. Um, once we do it, I would love to see um, really good high standards for the audits and, um, and paid for by some kind of um, uh, massive um, fund that the, that the, the companies that are audited have to pay into, um, which Deb didn't mention, but that is part of her paper. And I think it's an important, important point. And I'll stop there because I know this is a discussion. Great, thank you. DJ, take it away. Uh, well, the first, I, I, I wanna thank uh, Deborah for putting pen to paper. It's not easy. And, and I, I hope that no one's gonna interpret these comments as just criticism. I think it's very easy to, to, to um, throw stones at a proposal. And, and that's, that's just very hard. And apologies for the, the leaf blower that of course only can happen when you turn on your mic. The, the part, there's a couple of things that I would offer up is where my head goes in the, some of the things that I think about in, in this aspect. And I work in very regulated fields, including healthcare. And so I get to see some of the different aspects of audits and other things. And the first thing is that I think about is how do we accomplish the goal while ensuring that we don't have a suffocating regulatory burden? I think there's some regulatory burden is appropriate, but how do we ensure it's not suffocating? In particular, how do we ensure that it works for companies of all sizes or does not entrench one sector or company versus another? In, in the case of healthcare, for example, it's very easy to have a lot of the regulatory burden that prevents any innovation from taking place. And we've seen that additionally with the processes required to even work, bring new products in to support government. You have to go through FedRAMP being FedRAMP certified. That could cost you a million, $2 million just to start. And so companies will not show up to bring their products even if they're superior to others. And so how do we do that? Uh, one of the challenges I have in figuring out what is the appropriate form of an impact assessment, whether it's federal, state, or companies, is how do we make sure that it is agile? How does it adapt? How do we also simultaneously think about the speed and cost it takes to do that? And we've seen environmental impact assessments that can take extraordinary amounts of time, cost, and then we start back from square one every once in a while. And then when I think about oversight boards, I think there's a lot of interesting ideas around that. And I wanna wonder how can we ensure that we both have, we ensure that it's not a political process. We know that if we're gonna create something that is done by legislation, it's gonna have three people maybe chosen by uh, Democrats, three chosen by uh, Republicans in Congress, one pick those you know, by the uh, party in power by uh, who owns the presidency. How do we ensure that that's not just gonna be political and, and something that just regresses and gets us into gridlock uh, given that it's things that are at stake. And then the, the other portion is I think as, as Deborah said is there's lots of great analogies. There is what we've seen with FAA and what we've seen with FDA. And we also have seen extraordinary and I have personally received many of those criticisms about where we've seen those, those processes not evolve and have not kept up. And then the final thing is, uh, I would point out, uh, um, Hillary Mason, Mike Rukitas and I attempted to take some of these ideas and ask, how could we implement them in our companies, in our organizations? What we came back with is some of the things that I think we can do that try to change a culture, uh, because regulation is not going to just change a culture. And so what would it look like if we had something like EFF have a whistleblower kind of protection type thing? That would act more like an ombuds person. Is there something that we could have so it doesn't have to get it, uh, the direct shining light immediately? And maybe that's warranted over time, but that you could build this into a collaborative process, kind of like what we've seen with FAA. 
Could we have something in healthcare where there is a compliance person or ethics person that sits outside of reporting duties to the CEO and reports to the chairperson? Obviously, it doesn't work if the chairperson and the CEO are the same. And I think, I think these sessions are so important because as Kathy said, we got to think about this. Fiona's done a lot of work in this also. Is we got to get groups together to start discussions and hashing it out and stress testing these ideas. So I appreciate everyone bringing their, their, their whole selves and energy to this. Fantastic. Deb, did you want to just have a quick reaction to these comments? Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks both for those amazing comments. Um, I, I, I guess I wanted to like clarify a couple of things in response to um, BJ's comments in particular. I think that I often hear um, a bit of sort of ambiguity with respect to uh, the relationship between impact assessments and audits, where um, impact assessments have sort of, especially algorithmic impact assessments have sort of gained mainstream um, uh, uh, you know, dominance as sort of this interesting policy agenda around, um, you know, can we properly articulate the different ways in which the introduction of this algorithm will sort of impact the broader ecosystem of, you know, uh, whatever bureaucratic process or whatever, um, uh, you know, particular outcome. Um, uh, and I think that impact assessments are definitely important tools, uh, but a lot of work, I, I think there's, uh, there's been uh, recent work by Data and Society and recent work by um, um, you know legal scholars like Andrew Selfs that have looked at the fact that impact assessments are ultimately often operating as internal audits more than external audits. So they're often executed by the institution, um, either making use or hoping to make use of the algorithm, or they're implemented by um, the, the, the vendor itself or provided by the vendor itself. And that is very different from an audit, um, especially a third party audit, where um, it really is geared towards specifically evaluation, um, this sort of quantification of the difference between the expectation of what the system is supposed to do and the reality of where the system is. Um, and that's a much more precise uh, definition or goal of what the auditor is doing um, than an impact assessment, which has been sort of traditionally very ambiguous and can kind of, like you mentioned, grow into this thing of a multi-year process. Um, uh, in addition to being this very scope thing of a, you know, of a couple of a couple months, like it's a very sort of ill-defined um, uh, uh, sort of corpus, and as a result of that, it can kind of be interpreted in various ways. Whereas an audit, I think, is a little bit more of a grounded process. Um, and tends to be more specific towards evaluation. And, and there are definitely, um, I know like Kathy, for example, a lot of the work Orca does is very procedural as well. It's not just specific to, you know, uh, getting to an end result or auditing a particular outcome. You guys also sort of engage in these sort of um, uh, uh, assessments of sort of, you know, processes in place and evaluating if uh, the practice of the org is aligned in addition to the outcomes of the algorithm being aligned with expectations. Um, but I do think ultimately like audits are a little bit more scoped and also much more geared towards evaluation and how that integrates into accountability outcomes. So I wanted to like articulate that difference. Um, but to your point around, you know, uh, practically, you know, how does something like an oversight board happen, like who is actually going to take responsibility, someone needs to step up at some level. Um, the way I try to set up and like something I try to set up with the analogies is that there's actually a lot of opportunity uh, through these analogies to extend uh, some of the accountability infrastructures that already exist and just apply that to the algorithmic context as well. So for example, like I think a lot about how the FTC has certain investigative powers and inspection powers, or the FDA already has certain inspection powers. Um, you know, what would it mean for them to also consider the reality of the fact that there's a lot of, uh, let's say for the FDA, uh, algorithmic tools now being used in, you know, in the medical space, like how have they um, been able to accommodate that. And if they haven't, you know, and like I mentioned, a lot of regulators haven't really been thinking about how algorithms are going to affect their particular domain. And since they haven't, why don't they provide or why don't they share some of these inspection powers through a vetting process with other um, uh, sort of third parties that are qualified to, to take that role and to do that inspection work on their behalf? 
Um, it's like a similar sort of ideology to the auditing organizations that I mentioned in the medical device space, where you can't have, you know, a healthcare department or, uh, you know, I, I'm Canadian, so I'm thinking of Health Canada, but the FDA, uh, you, you know, you don't necessarily need to hire individuals at the FDA that are experts in terms of assessing every type of medical device. You can actually outsource that um, that inspection to a set of qualified auditing organizations that you appoint, that you assess according to your standards of what qualifications are required and what levels of independence are required. Um, and then you kind of give them the work to be able to do that. And, and I think that the, you know, uh, in the proposal, it is very, you know, the initial vision was for an auditing oversight board that could sort of exist across domains. Um, but I think, you know, you know, if the FTC or the FDA wanted right now to sort of um, come up with uh, a board within the within their own agency uh, to to sort of uh, um, delegate, you know, the subset of issues related to algorithmic development and algorithmic tools, like that's something that could definitely happen very quickly. Um, uh, sort of like a localized version of the broader audit oversight board that could exist. Um, but I think this plays to what Kathy was saying around um, standards. Like it's just very difficult. To do any of this when there hasn't really been a clear conversation around, um, you know, what it means to do a good audit and uh, to not fall into the trap, like she mentioned, of finance, where um, uh, not only what does it mean to do a good audit, but what does it mean to actually be an independent auditor and what are you allowed to do or not allowed to do? Sort of this meta accountability issue that exists. Yeah. Um, let me jump in for a second because one of the my favorite parts of your talk was the uh, the persistent return to analogies and the ways that we already do this in society. Mm -hmm. I think that's incredibly important. Um, it's easy to fall into the trap that I think many platforms would like us to fall into that this is all very complicated and it's rocket science. It's really hard and so on. Whereas in fact automobiles are very dangerous and we have ways to regulate them and make them safer. And this just isn't different in that same way. Yeah. And therefore a lot of the powers ought to already exist. And we just simply need to recognize these are dangerous or, or biased or yeah. causing discrimination in a way that's already outlawed. So I think that's a, a more productive direction. I also think that while academics can spend a lot of time saying, let's analyze this really meta subject and let's try to make it perfect. And let's worry about the things that DJ was talking about. You know, can we get good people from the government to do it? Won't this extra regulatory burden inhibit creativity and innovation? Uh, that those are the perfect being the enemy of the good very often. And you often are gonna see the parties that benefit. Why do we have these algorithms and problems? because someone's making money. They're not generally out there just trying to cause social uh, upheaval. They, they're, they're doing it for a profit motive. So that means that they're gonna work pretty hard to keep those profits, which means that they're gonna pile up uh, reasons why it's very necessary to have a perfect system rather than a before launch. Good enough, system. yeah. I, so I think that's something to keep in the back of, I mean, all of the academics should keep that in the back of their mind because I think uh, that can sometimes get in the way of useful progress. I'll stop there and let, I think Kathy had her hand up a minute ago. Yeah, yeah, and I, I just wanna, I, I love the the car, I use the car analogy as well. Um, the thing is about cars is that like people died there by the side of the road and we can see, oh, that person fell through the windshield. Oh, oh people who sit in the back seat aren't as, aren't as uh, endangered. Oh, we should put kids in the back seat. Oh, car seats help. Like we saw this in a kind of very concrete way but these are questions we don't ask of algorithms, right? So uh, to Deb's point, like impact analysis, actually I would argue is what I do because I don't know how, how people are harmed, where the harms live. And therefore I haven't designed the monitors in the cockpit because I don't know like what the monitor should be measuring. I don't know like I should that I should be measuring, is there a seatbelt? Is there a, you know, an airbag or whatever. I'm mixing metaphors here, but you understand what I'm saying. So like the impact assessment is absolutely required because, well, from my perspective, it's just asking who's harmed here. And that's a, like, a, that's like, who are the stakeholders? What is the impact of the stakeholders? When is it bad? Um, but to DJ's point, I really think it's important to understand that like designing a cockpit is a lot of work. Um, and it should be done, uh, should be borne, the burden of it should be borne by the large companies making a lot of money to Fiona's point. And then it should be um, sort of a minimal viable uh, 
audit should be uh, taken on by the regulators and they should insist that everyone does it. But by the time they've done that, that's a lot less work. You're saying like, here are the tests you have to run. You have to report these every quarter or every month or whatever it is or on an ongoing basis. Um, that's actually a lot less work for the smaller companies. And I think we should see it that way, that like there's a startup cost, there's a transition cost that should be worked out between the regulators and the larger players. And then once it's sort of been defined, it, it should be uh, distributed to everyone. That's my two cents. So I think like, you know, uh, there's a lot of like focus on, uh, I guess another way of like interpreting the proposal though, is that, you know, we, because I, I guess one of the, one of my concerns around allowing uh, the, the companies to participate in, um, you know, defining uh, audit standards in any capacity is because the companies have sort of already, you know, proven that they have, they, they, they are willing to engage in a lot of sort of deceptive practice to like disguise the extent to which these systems fail, like the way in which AI capabilities are exaggerated means that companies will sometimes like, you know, um, and Kathy, you've experienced this when you, when they'll agree to release information or release code, um, you know, be like completely unreadable because there's just, you know, there's no data dictionary, there's no definition of the variables, um, or they'll, uh, and this is what Facebook has done many times in a settlement with the ACLU, they, they will, they will make all these claims about how they're going to adjust the algorithm. And then if you reevaluate them externally, uh, and then they'll sort of, release internal reports about how they've made these changes. But then when you evaluate them externally, you find that they haven't actually made those changes, which which is what happened with the uh, their ad delivery algorithm for housing. So I do, I do think like, I don't actually think we need the companies to cooperate in any capacity. <laughs> like I'm very- oh, wait. Can, oh, can I jump in? There's, yeah, sure. It's costly to do this. So I'm with Kathy on the following front. Put the costs onto the large corporations to, to set it up and do it. But then your point is, the government, the regulator has to be able to come in and see exactly, see everything and double check and yeah. be able to back it because then it will be done in a non-deceptive manner if it can yeah. be done by somebody who's a third party. I, I guess can I just, I guess my, I just oh, sorry. another example. Sorry, Deb, but I, I, I'm, right. I'm agreeing with you. I, I'm agreeing with both Fiona and you, and I'll, I'll just give you the setup I'm thinking about. Like when I work with AGs, um, they try to go they try to go after big players who can afford the work. And the work is in that case is like, they have to hire a lawyer. They have to give us the data. They have to deal with us, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we're being paid by the AGs, but not, not by them, but it's still a burden on them. But the point is that like, here's, here's the current situation. There was a payday lender that I, I am allowed to talk about um, that I computed the effective APR in the state of Illinois, which has a usury rate of 36%. Their effective APR is 500%. Like I showed one graph to the judge. I mean, the judge got to see one, one scatter plot and was like, okay, this is illegal, give restitution. And that was great. There was a rule that was broken. That rule then somehow disappeared into the ether only to be rediscovered next time a payday lender does something awful. Like, why isn't that a rule that they always have to, that every payday lender has to prove on an ongoing basis that they are following? And, and similarly, Raj, Deb, like, Yes, they shouldn't really get to say what the rules are that they're they're going to have to pass, right? Mm -hmm. But the point is that they will have to hand over the data to show whether or not they're passing, they're they're failing or passing the tests. Yeah, I th I, th I think what I'm trying to get at is that I, uh, um, you know, part of the motivation for this proposal is about minimizing the amount of opportunity companies have in terms of dictating anything about. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the level of accountability they have to experience. So right now, even as an external auditor, you're, you're completely beholden to how the company reacts to your audit. Like they have full choice to, you know, uh, like persecute you because you access the information incorrectly, or even like ignore the result completely. Like they're, everything is in the company's hands right now. Um, and I think that like, you know, uh, a lot of the policy interventions I hear are attempts to sort of manage corporate behavior. So even um, you know some of these internal audit um, uh, proposals, like GDPR, is like uh, you know data protection impact assessment, for example, is something that the companies have to do. So there's a lot of policy right now, AI policy that's very focused on 
update updating co corporate behavior oh what can we do to sort of mandate that companies act in a particular way and i think something that i'm trying to say is that i i definitely think we need regulation to control corporate behavior but there's also this group of people that have already been doing a lot of this accountability work can we also have regulation to just protect them and to support them to be able to do their work you know do we actually need corporate participation in order for or, or corporate cooperate like do we need like the corporations to agree or to to, to sort of um do we need corporate cooperation in order to to you know uh, protect to give to give third party auditors legal immunity from like retali legal retaliation i don't i don't think we need corporations in order to do that right so I, i'm trying to like figure out like you know is there a way to sort of reframe the ai policy conversation where it's less focused on you know dictating what a company should or shouldn't do and it's more focused on sort of protecting and supporting uh, external actors that are already doing the work uh, to be able to do their work more effectively and to be able to do more work or better work, really. I mean, I don't want to hog the, this the floor, but I will say absolutely, <laughs> we need both. We need both. Like we need- He's just silently need, sitting like, there, I'm not academic, sure. <laughs> we need academic researchers to be able to access Facebook at, 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 at all levels, at every yeah. single level to understand how our democracy is at stake. And yet I still feel like you're never going to get the, the rules that insurance companies should be following on internal policies um, by activism. You just, it's just too, it's too deep and yeah. we still need to figure out rules for that. So we have to do both. I, that's my theory. Okay. Jay, do you have a theory? Well, I guess what I'm struggling with is this is spans so many different areas. <laughs> it's a little hard to, to kind of narrow it down. Like maybe what comes to my mind is, you know, I think I've spent a lot of time with FDA. I've spent a lot of time recently around COVID and the state systems, both on, on um, you know, the direct public health and delivery of benefits. And what I see a lot of times is you've got, and Kathy points this out a lot in her book also, is that you've got a lot of these small actors and a lot of algorithms, a lot of systems where it's, it's everyone's spread extraordinarily thin. If you want, if we think about the FDA in itself, just as an FDA and their ability to regulate their um, just pharmaceutical drugs, we're in a we're in a very bad spot right now on their ability to execute. I mean, we've hauled yeah, out I mean, institution. Okay. The FDA is a failed agency that is a, just a disaster in every way. I don't think there's I, I wouldn't go that algorithms. far to say it's failed. Agency. Uh, oh, I still there, trust well, I still trust my drugs. That's I don't think another we have corruption that's another our, conference. Our, our but, thing. but I think he's frozen for me too. Anyway, I think the algorithms for are the least of the FDA's problems, <laughs> but I'm perfectly prepared to believe that algorithms are also a problem. Um, yeah, I think they're also a problem in addition of. <laughs> oh, I think he is frozen. Oh no. <laughs> um, All right. Well, we've got uh, ten minutes or so left. I don't know if the two of you can see the questions that have come in. Um, do you uh, do you want to pick up uh, the transparency idea? We haven't really talked very much about that. And Frances Haugen was quite big on. I thought she was quite clever in not having a saying. Here's the rule I want for the algorithm. Let's have a regulator that just has a lot of transparency, so we can all see what's happening. And I'm I'm with her when it comes to algorithms creating anorexia. I feel like it's pretty clear to society that that's bad. And if you make that transparent, you'll get a reaction. I'm not sure if transparency uh, is goes further than that. What do you two think about about that tool? Yeah, so I, I think it's a mechanism towards accountability. Like I was mentioning, um, a lot of third parties struggle with access and with transparency because they have a goal of leveraging that transparency to be able to execute on these evaluations and these assessments that can then be sort of leveraged as evidence of a particular harm being perpetuated you know whether it be bias or functional failure or 
um, uh, you know, other types of violations or concerns. So I do think that um, transparency sort of plays this role of, um, you know, facilitating scrutiny and providing an opportunity for external scrutiny in a way that can lead to the kind of evidence you need to, to, to hold different stakeholders accountable. Uh, yeah. So it's only as useful as like the people, you know, uh, leveraging that information um, it's low hanging uh, fruit, but it's not going to get us all the way there. Yeah, it's not going to get us all the way there for sure. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask one more about what do you think would incentivize and drive more cooperative algorithmic audits? A recent example is the independent audit of the startup company Pymetrics candidate screening tool. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think, that, is it for me or just for, I guess, for either of you? Okay. Um, I don't know, Kathy, if you want to speak. I've, I've been speaking a lot. <laughs> I mean, that was a, that, you know, those will happen when when companies are willing to let them happen, right? The, the, but the kind of the point is that uh, it's, it, it, unfortunately, it's certainly there's no leverage to make that happen. Um, and it is, you know, a, a choice of the people who do let it happen. And sometimes it's you know a PR move. You know sometimes it's sometimes it's a it's a really true, um, earnest attempt to, to do as well as possible. And I should say that like a lot of my clients and and I'm with you, Deb. I don't really trust corporations, but a lot of my clients are 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 calling me because they can't sleep at night and they want to make sure that they're they're working for a company that they trust. So there are also uh, you know people within these companies that that are trustworthy, and we do have to. We need them because we need to. We need them to um, explain to us what's actually happening in the real world. There's no reason for them to tell us. There's no law that they need to tell us. So it's really important. DJ's back. Yeah, DJ, DJ back. why don't you finish that thought that you were in the middle of when the uh, sorry, I was trying to figure out where our Comcast outage is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got a little something unstable. Um, yeah, I, I think that the. the I don't want to derail from you obviously all carried on forward is is the thing that I think about is the actual implementation of these things. And one of the things I would say is one of the big efforts that you've perhaps seen in the Biden and Harris administration is this idea of this concept of delivery, which is how do we actually take policies and execute them? And one of the things that's being attempted to be done in that process is because things have such an algorithm nature is to drive a better thinking and openness around these things. But it's gonna require a, a large collective action for that to happen. Not only of technologists, but academics, everybody, activists, everyone coming to, to help on this. And it, it's, I think it's early days. So that's that's why I, I kind of highlight and I gear towards more of these aspects because we are trying to right say these agencies and figure these things out. You know, if I don't, if you don't mind, can I ask you to weigh in on this? I mean, you're the you have a lot of experience with actual regulation, actually working or not. Yeah, um, I think that. You know, right now we have a Congress that's not going to do anything, um, and so uh, so all of us can say, "Isn't this terrible? It's causing harm, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. But that's that there aren't going to be any new powers given here because corporations make money doing this, and they go to the Congress or the Senate and they pay and they get the laws they want. So I don't, I'm not really optimistic that we get a law. So I think the way you got to think about this is what existing laws are out there. And analogizing to, you know, we don't worry about harm from buggy whips anymore. So, and, but, but the statutes of harm are still there and we move on to algorithms. I mean, we, like, we just have to, we invent planes, we have we worry about harm from planes, we invent cars, we worry about harm from cars. So I think we have to use what we have. And then the second thing is that if you can put a lot of the burden onto corporations on a, in a standardized way, tell them what's expected and say, there can't be discrimination. We expect you to do internal audits, you report them once a quarter. You then have a lot more, I think, buy-in from courts that if a corporation is covering up something or doing it wrong or failing to put in appropriate resources and they're saying to the government, everything's fine when it's not, that's a very different liability posture than you were running your business and oops, accidentally something happened. Mm. So uh, there's a, I think 
putting the burden, uh, as much of the burden as you can on the corporation, but again, being sensitive to this entry and competition issue, we don't want burdens to be so high that nobody little can ever get started uh, in a business. So we have to be sensitive, I think, also to saying, well, harm is going to be bigger when the corporation's bigger and has more users and affects more people. And so we're going to have a standard for that entity that's different than a startup. Maybe we give the startup a break, not to say there can't be harmful startups, but that if we want entry and challenging, we want to challenge on the basis of quality, better service, we want entry. And if they're doing problematic stuff, then we're going to catch them when they, when they grow. Um, so those would be a few principles that I think are helpful to getting going in a hostile environment. Uh, I have like a follow up question, Fiona, around, um, you know, some of these proposals are not necessarily, um, uh, there's not like a legal mandate necessary for these proposals to happen. So something like an audit oversight board is like an action that a federal agency can take on their own. So regardless of how uh, efficient or inefficient Congress is, uh, do you feel like there's specific aspects of this proposal or other proposals that could actually um, uh, be pushed forward independent of, you know, um, absolutely. Absolutely. That, yeah. That's exactly why I like it so much because we have, you have all these analogies that agencies have authority. They can say, this is an unfair method of competition. This is deception. This is discrimination. And we have rules about that. And the way we're going to uh, uh, advance uh, progress is by setting up some internal to our agency system. And that's the executive branch. And the executive branch is interested in fixing some of this. Okay. Uh, so I think absolutely that's the direction to push right now, executive uh, actions. To Fiona's point, there's nothing that prevents the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of Commerce or Secretary of Transportation from saying, we're gonna do this under procurement rules. Yeah. And, and establish these things. We're about to have, a lot of money flowing to the Department of Transportation, especially in a connected transportation framework. They could easily put this into the rule set and have the courage to do it at the agency level. And, and I would love right. to see an example of that so that then the agencies act as experiments exactly. and they have the ability to be more agile as they update the procurement right. rule set. But remember, if you were going to identify a captured agency other than the FDA, which is also one of my favorites, the Department of Transportation and the Department of Agriculture are right up there. So we have to tell them, no, the point of this money is not to enrich airlines. The point of this money is to protect all of us mm -hmm. from whatever it is. So the executive order, Biden's executive order on competition is a really good one, but also thinking about anti-racism and generally uh, uh, social justice is another good one to just keep repeating. Hmm. So Eric, not, not to get nitty gritty, yeah, but I'll, I'll just add one thing about executive orders because I agree with Fiona on the executive, the EO front. My experience with EOs, executive orders, has been you need still someone who's going to push because just because you have an EO, it doesn't get the bureaucracy. It gives an excuse for the bureaucracy to do the right thing, yeah. but it doesn't make the bureaucracy do the right thing. Unfortunately, yeah. as much as we would like. Agreed. Agreed. Well, DJ, uh, yeah, you've had you've had some experience with that. I, I wanted to get some of the questions in from the the audience, and, and we have a number of them here in Slido. So I'll just take a, I'll just read a few of them here. Um, here's one from Sasha Costanza Chalk. Um, she asks, um, could you talk more about the difference between incident reporting, like PAI, which is focused on news reports, and harms reports, like AJLs, focused on those who can experience harm, and why are both needed? I think it's mainly for, for you, Deb, but, but any of you may want to weigh in. Yeah, so I think there's there's already a set of uh, tools out there of people sort of tracking the different um, uh, incidents that have been happening with respect to AI um, uh, deployment. So uh, the incident report is sort of really stories that have already made their way into the press or have sort of escalated to viral status on social media. Um, and, and that gets logged um, through the PAI database. And there's also, like I mentioned, the algorithm tips tool that is used by a lot of investigative journalists. And it's really just, it's a transparency tool to just list out all the different um, algorithmic deployments by public agencies. And it's a tool for journalists to sort of try to find leads of um, different uh, um, algorithms to investigate. And that's kind of different from this concept of um, harms discovery or harms reporting, where you actually have, in the case of AJL, we actually have, you know, like firsthand accounts 
of different individuals that uh, perceive that they've been harmed by an algorithm, or uh, maybe their legal representation contacting us for support in terms of, um, you know, expert testimony or something like that. So that, that um, the, the, the main difference is really one focusing on the harm and not just the existence of an algorithm in a particular context, but really trying to map out uh, that a harm has occurred versus just mapping out that there's the presence of an algorithm in a situation that was harmful um, and, and tying it into this uh, person or this individual or institution uh, seeking justice as a result of that. So it's a lot more of like an actionable, actionable frame. And it's also, I guess, useful in that way for tar uh, target identification for auditing. And if I could uh, follow up with another question uh, from the audience that I think relates uh, directly to this, uh, the the proposal I think uh, sort of uh, uh, says that um, uh, sort of audit authorities of existing governmental regulatory bodies should be increased. And how practical is it uh, to believe that these bodies currently have or could access the kind of talent that they would need to competently execute on these responsibilities. I think it's probably most closely related to the kinds of concerns that I think DJ has articulated so well. Yeah. Um, so if you could, if, if any of you could kind of weigh in on that, I think that'd be helpful to hear. Yeah, I have thoughts, but I don't, I don't want to hog the mic. <laughs> I, I can, I can respond briefly and then maybe others can. That's why we put you on the spot, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I've been talking Welcome for a while. The spotlight. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was going to say, like, I, I definitely think that, um, you know, one of the reasons why I find it really interesting to sort of extend um, uh, privileges, access privileges, but perhaps other privileges as well, enforcement privileges I mentioned towards the end, um, to other third party actors beyond regulators is because of this capacity issue. So um, this is also a reason why, uh, or the, the main excuse a lot of companies don't want to release information to regulators because they're stating that, you know, oh, we actually do a really good job protecting these people's privacy and, you know, we have like all these security measures. And, you know, uh, I don't know if a lot of regulators even have like a, a, a back end engineer maintaining the database, much less adding security and privacy features to the database. So, you know, can a regulator really hold the information that the, the company, if the company was to provide all, like if Facebook was to provide regulators with full access to their system, how would we guarantee that the regulator would, um, you know, have all the security and privacy measures that the Facebook engineers have already established for that data, right? So there's a lot of that tension that exists um, when people, ask for regulators to be given access. I think there's a couple interesting ideas out there. And a lot of these ideas have kind of come out of conversation. Um, the EU commission has sort of drafted this digital services act. And there's uh, a couple articles in there that are related to this idea of independent auditing. And um, uh, some interesting conversations have come out of that where people have said, well, it's not like access is a zero one it's not a zero zero one sort of game of you know it's everything or nothing uh there's sort of intermediary opportunities where uh, maybe the way that access can be mediated is through request so uh, maybe the regulator doesn't have the technical capacity to host all of the information of a particular organization or company but they would be able to um, demand or request an engineer to be able to give them certain types of information. Um, there's also maybe a framework where uh, they can contract or uh, uh, delegate, uh, like I mentioned in the proposal, uh, certain uh, uh, investigations to external third-party auditors um, uh, or recruit through a bounty or, or, or other means um, to facilitate interest in addressing that particular investigation. Um, but again, there's the vetting process has to happen, and that's why the audit oversight board is such an essential component of the proposal. I okay. think that it's really important not to say uh, we're only going to do algorithmic oversight when we can get the best talent in the government, because we know we live in America where we don't give the government enough money remotely to do that. So there has to be a setup where we employ the, the civil society and nonprofits to, to come in and visit or to check up exactly at like a board. And that the, what the government does is require these whatever standards that get checked up on by other people. Yeah. Kathy, you had your hand up and I interrupted. Yeah, no, you didn't interrupt, thank you. Um, I will just say that as somebody who works, who talks to regulators all the time, number one, they don't currently have the capacity. Number two, um, yeah. you know, there's absolutely a lot of people who want to work on this stuff. Uh, you know, they really do. 
Um, and number three, like I keep on, um, and this is the, something that maybe I, that's probably where I disagree with Deb the most, but like I still I think we're our spirit in spirit agree. We disagree. We actually <laughs> <laughs> we must like we must burden the people that that make money off these algorithms. So for example, I keep on hearing this idea that like we could institute a requirement that if like a government agency licenses an algorithm, that the person that the 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 it needs to be vetted. Right. And like that, it needs to be the vetting needs to be supplied um, essentially by that third party. Mm -hmm. um, so they have to make the case, i.e., they have to make the case that what they're doing is fair and legal. Um, and to, to Fiona's point, that, that that would not finish the job because they would probably come up with a crappy way of doing that, but it would, it would reduce their plausible deniability, which, by the way, is the single biggest reason I don't get clients in my second party auditing firm um, companies because they don't want to know the answer and they don't think they have to. So the point is that they make a requirement that they actually have to pre at least pretend to know the answer to some of these questions, um, that would be a big step forward. Yeah, but just to, to like summarize and answer Dan's point, I think it's about broadening the scope of participation, right? Like the regulators should not be bearing the full front of um, uh, the, the work in terms of acquiring that information and doing the all the analysis and then leveraging towards accountability like the all steps should not be executed purely by the regulator that's a lot of that's a that's a lot to ask and i think like where me um kathy and fiona kind of agree and maybe dj but i don't want to speak for him <laughs> um uh is around this idea of just broadening the scope of participation to include other third parties but also like you mentioned kathy maybe uh give some of the labor to the corporations themselves as well we're just about out of time here. So uh, just a quick answer from, from any of you, but especially you, Deb. Um, and uh, I'll, as, a, as an economist, I'll pick uh, one of the questions that deals with incentives. It, the question is, the proposal calls for transparency of audit results. I see a lot of virtues in that, but what do the critics say when we worry about innovation effects? Audits could divulge sensitive information and undercut innovation incentives, enabling spying on competitors. Yeah. I hear this a lot. <laughs> um, I think I think there's like I like I mentioned earlier. Um, I don't think access is a zero sum game. I think it's definitely a situation where you can have. Uh, so uh, you know, the final slide I talk about um, having a centralized database of audit results, um, uh, similar to like you know the SEC's database of of corporate filings and and things like that. Um, but uh, you know, it might not necessarily need to be publicly accessible, just because, especially as part of algorithmic audits, there at times does need to be access to data and you know information that could be protected under um, you know intellectual property. So uh, it could be a situation where the database is there and it's visible to you know certain regulators that have access, and the public can maybe request to view, um, and then those applications are vetted, similar to a FOIA request. But the fact that the information is within a public institution where there's that opportunity for a FOIA request type relationship versus that comfort that that information just locked within a private institution that like has no sort of um, opportunity or mechanism for public access, I think is a huge difference where it doesn't need to be, you know, published <laughs> um, uh, publicly, but there's a lot of these sort of intermediary options that we can think about um, when uh, reflecting on how to release this information. If it's made uh, sort of um, if it's centralized within a public database uh, and made accessible to regulators, there's still a lot of opportunity for that to be leveraged towards broader accountability um, and provide the public an avenue to be able to access if they really, really want to. Well, I think we're going to have to call that a, a wrap. Uh, we are at time. Uh, but uh, thank you so much, uh, Deb, uh, DJ, uh, Kathy, and Fiona for uh, joining us uh, for this uh, really terrific uh, uh, panel. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, with that, uh, I think uh, Eric and I just thank wanted you. to offer uh, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. We wanted to just uh, offer a few uh, concluding uh, thoughts to this conference with a, a, a few points. Uh, first, uh, just I want to, uh, it's been a terrific set of discussions over the past two days. We've covered a lot of terrain. We've gone from uh, Louis Brandeis's trust busting to questions about what uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. really meant, uh, whether it was universal basic income or guaranteed income, 
to data ownership and whether data ownership is even a, a coherent and constitutional principles, to questions about the fragility of humanity as exposed by research on platform uh, misinformation. And uh, while we've covered all that terrain, in, in many ways, the proposals are tackling and trying to wrestle with common problems. Data cooperatives are trying to take the perceived windfalls and uh, redistribute them to consumers or data producers by contract or license, much like how UBI is trying to work through the tax system to try to uh, engage in that form of, of kind of uh, redistribution. And algorithmic auditing is trying to make clear what algorithmic harms might be through a kind of informational intervention, much like intermediaries attempt to empower consumers to choose based on the quality not solely the price of products. And uh, second, I think the goal of this conference uh, that Eric and I have had in mind all along has been to move the dialogue with these concrete radical proposals. Um, in, other, in the words of DJ, really the goal is to begin to stress test some of these really important ideas. And we recognize that what is radical is really in the eye of the beholder. Some will say that these proposals are too pie in the sky. Uh, but if there's one thing that Andrew Yang's uh, political uh, presence has shown us is how much the so-called Overton window, the part of the policy space that appears politically acceptable at a given moment, can shift through the agency of specific individuals. Yet others will say these proposals are not radical enough, and that's of course fine. What we've tried to do here is to move toward concrete proposals precisely because the AI governance debate has been a little bit stuck in abstractions. And if we can push forward concrete proposals to solve these wicked problems, uh, we're all ears. Third, we wanna thank all of the presenters for putting forth and engaging uh, with these big ideas in such a uh, spirited, uh, 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 and impactful ways. Uh, this event would not have been possible without the help from a large range of folks. So we did wanna uh, at least uh, note the amazing people who have made this event possible. Uh, the high events team, uh, Celia Clark and Casey Peel, uh, the policy team, Russell Wald, Mike Salido and Tina uh, Wang, the communications team, Stacey Pena, Shana Lynch and Janina Kazuzi. Um, and all the high fellows and Christy Ko and Christine Zhang who helped with the proposal selection uh, and the fantastic Stanford video team and Gordon Gurley who, who've helped uh, to make all of this uh, possible and many other amazing high staff members who have helped to make uh, this event uh, come together. Thanks, Dan. And, and to wrap up, uh, Dan and I want to end with a, a call to action. Uh, we've both been to more conferences than we can count probably like most of you. And while we love to hear smart people weighing in on the big topics of the day and enumerating all the problems we face, what we love even more is hearing solutions. Uh, we're mindful optimists and we believe that we can build a better society, but that it won't happen automatically, that it takes concrete action. And that's why we tried something different with this conference. Uh, last spring, we publicly solicited radical solutions for a better society. And as we hoped, we got dozens and dozens of thoughtful proposals. Uh, we read them all and we picked four to be presented over the past couple of days. And we also sought to include, as you heard, a, a diverse set of experts to comment on them from different perspectives. And now that the conference is done, I can say that we were delighted with what we heard over the past two days. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Uh, but this conference was not meant to be the last word on these topics. Our goal is to start a conversation or really a set of conversations. And we wanna get them started in a concrete way that provokes folks not only deep thinking, but real action. And so we hope to see action on these four proposals and on the other ways that we may be able to grapple with the rise of AI and build a better economy and society. So we encourage you to engage with these proposals, to reflect on the ideas, debate them with your friends and your family and your colleagues, but don't stop there. Join organizations to help improve and promote and enact them. Contact your representatives and other policymakers. You heard uh, Eric Lander invite you uh, to, to uh, comment on it. In fact, the OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, has scheduled six listening sessions. I hope you'll go to them and give your advice. Uh, I just We just put the link in Slido so you can easily find those. I'm gonna make it as easy as possible for you guys to do your homework. Um, and don't be afraid to suggest a radical new idea yourself. Sometimes a radical solution is exactly what's needed to harness the power of radical new technologies. 
And whether your own radical proposal gets uh, enacted um, uh, or, it, uh, or not, simply stating it is one way that you can shift the Overton window. Uh, that's how we open people's minds to what new ideas are even fair game to consider. We sincerely hope you enjoyed this conference and we want to hear how we can improve. So for all those who register, you'll receive a survey the next day or two asking your opinions on what worked well and what we could do better. And if you want to rewatch this conference video or if you want to learn more about HI and our work or attend other events, you can visit our website at hi.stanford.edu or follow us on our social media channels. There's also a mail list you can join that's also uh, posted in Slido now, I believe. And uh, we have more activities in the pipeline. Very Next week, just next week, we have a conference on data-centric AI. Our spring conference is already scheduled. That's April 12th and 13th, so mark your calendars. It's going to be co-chaired by Fei Fei Li and Chris Manning. Um, and uh, you know, to sum up, I think the next decade can be one of the best decades that humanity has ever experienced. But only if we remember that humans had the agency, not technology. At Stanford High, we're working to fulfill the potential of human-centered AI, and we hope the, the proposals you've heard over the past two days have inspired you to join in that mission. So thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to working with you going forward.